Okay, good morning, members. I declare the meeting now open to the public online, and I would like to welcome the members who are participating today by video conferencing to enable us to maintain the social distancing requirements that are so important at this time. And I'd like to welcome then via video conferencing member Pat Sheehan and Paula Bradshaw. Uh, I would like to remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices. So, in terms of apology, the committee office received no apologies. Are members aware of any other apologies? No. Okay. Thank you, members. Moving on then to chairperson's business. Um, today, just I want to reflect on the very welcome decision in my view, and I think committee members would share it uh, on the the facilitation of direct representation of allied health professionals on the Department of Health Management Board. That's something that's come up in committee a few times. The committee pressed hard for that enhanced recognition of the 14 allied health professionals. It's appropriate, I think, to reflect their expanded future role, in key trans key, which is key to transformation, as set out in the Ben Gore report. And I think, uh, I think, you know, not only do we see the value of them, and, and there was a recent BBC report, which I believe went into very a nice example of how many professionals assist a person's recovery and getting them back to their their normal kind of our best way of operating. Um, so I think that's welcome. I think it's also good that we'll, we'll see that hopefully being rolled out in terms of transformation out into community settings. I think it's of value. So I thought that was, that was a, a very welcome decision, I have to say. Do members want to say anything on that, just at that point? Yes, Pat. Yeah, just to say, very welcome um, news, because I think we were all in agreement from, from the beginning that, that it's really important to have those allied health professionals on board uh, with their expertise. And as you say, Chair, going forward with transformation, they're going to be very much part of that uh, multidisciplinary approach. So I, I just very much welcome it. Thank you. Orlea? Just to follow on from um, Pam's comments and, and your own chair, just to think the, the committee um, from the committee was up and running. I think that all of the, the parties and the members have consistently raised the issue, um, you know, at one point or another. Um, on behalf of the, the allied health professionals and the important work that they do and having that mm. voice on the management board. So just well done. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, members on the phone want to make any on the video want to make any comment in relation to the allied health professional decision. No, okay. Just, just welcome it, chair. It's great news. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Okay, members. The only other piece of chair's business really then was that I attended yesterday NIPSA uh, NIPSA branch AGM. Um, uh, so on. Uh, um, okay. Thank you. Um, I've gone then to the draft minutes. Um, item three there, I refer members to the draft meeting minutes of the meeting held on the 3rd of December, which are tab 3.1 of your meeting pack. Are members content with the minutes? Yeah, members content, thank you. There is one matter arising from our discussions last week. I'm advised there is no procedural impediment to the committee seeking to engage with its Oireachtas counterparts. So are members therefore content to write to the Oireachtas Health Committee to discuss pandemic management? Yeah, members content. Thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, we're taking a briefing this morning. Then members, our first briefing in relation to our COVID nineteen work is a briefing from the Ambul ambulance service trust. I refer members to tab five of your pack there, and I can advise members that the chief executive and other officials from the ambulance service trust are here today to brief the committee. I would now like to welcome by video link, Mr. Michael Bloomfield, chief executive of the ambulance service. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Chair. Um, can, can, yeah. you hear, so can you hear me okay? Yes, we're hearing you there. We're hearing you fine. Um, thank you, Michael. Dr. <laughs> Nigel Ruddle, Medical Director, and I hope I've got the pronunciation right. Are you there, Dr. Nigel Ruddle? Yes, good morning. Thank you. Good morning. And Miss Rosie Byrne, who's Director of Operations. So you're very, all very welcome, all very welcome to our committee this morning. Um, if I could ask each of you, if you're, if you have the ability to use a headset, that would be, a, it seems to be better. But also, if you could, um, when you're not speaking, if you could keep yourself on mute, that it helps with the the quality of the of the uh, sound. And were you indicating there, Rosie? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't. Were you indicating that you wanted to say something just before we went to the briefing? No, no, no. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so listen, you're very, very welcome today, um, Michael. Do you want to, do you want to let us know how you're going to uh, handle the, the briefing, and then we'll go into a question and answer session. 
Yes, thank you and good morning, Chair and uh, committee members. I'd like to thank the committee for this opportunity uh, to, to brief you on the challenges facing the ambulance service, particularly as a result of COVID, how we're managing these and our longer term plans to improve our service. As you've said, Chair, I'm joined this morning uh, in the room with me, socially distanced, as uh, I hope you can see, uh, with Rosie Byrne, who's our Director of Operations, and then uh, on the screen, Dr Nigel Ruddle, who is our Medical Director. Uh, we sent you some background information in the form of a, a slide pack. It's not our intention to deliver that as a presentation, uh, but hope it has provided you with some useful information uh, and provide some of the figures to support some of the, the comments that we will refer to in our opening uh, remarks. Uh, if the committee is content, I'll make a few general introductory remarks. Uh, Nigel will then describe the new ambulance clinical response model that we introduced around a year ago, uh, the impact it has had and the further benefits that it will deliver when fully implemented. And then Rosie will outline the particular challenges uh, that uh, COVID has presented us and how we have managed those. I'll conclude briefly uh, by uh, outlining our longer term strategic plans. So we aim to take no longer than 10 minutes for that, if that's okay. And then of course, we'll be more than happy to take uh, your questions. That's like the rest of the Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks Chair. So like the rest of the health service, the COVID pandemic has presented real challenges for the ambulance service. Our staff have been working under extreme pressure now for nine months, but that was immediately following a difficult winter. So it's, it's really over a year now that they, they've worked in those sorts of challenging circumstances, and we all expect a very difficult uh, three to four months ahead over the winter time. So staff are extremely tired. They haven't had the type of breaks that they normally would. They are working in difficult conditions, wearing PPE almost all of the time during their 12-hour their shifts, and they face the same restrictions and anxieties in their personal lives as the rest of the population. Yet despite all this, they have consistently risen to the challenge throughout the last year. They've given everything that has been asked of them uh, and more, and I have no doubt they will continue to do so during the difficult months ahead. I'd like to pay tribute to them for their commitment, dedication and professionalism. But the challenges NIAS uh, is facing aren't just as a result of the pandemic. There have been underlying pressures for some time due to increases in demand, not being met by an increase in capacity in terms of our staffing levels. There was also a period of around four years from 2014 to 2018 when there was no supply of paramedics uh, locally. And that has led to reliance uh, on staff working overtime for us to be able to provide our planned levels of cover. Something staff were very willing to do during the early stages of the pandemic, but is becoming increasingly difficult to sustain as time goes by. And we also have a reliance on the use of uh, private and voluntary ambulance providers to supplement our capacity. And these things in turn have impacted on our ability to respond in a timely way to all of the calls that we receive. And while Nigel will now say something about what we have done to target our resources at the most urgent calls, I recognise that many patients wait too long for an ambulance to arrive and do not receive the experience that we would wish to provide them, despite the, the very best efforts of our staff. And I do uh, apologise to, to patients and their families when, when that is the case. But if I could pass to Nigel, he will say what we have done to try to mitigate against that. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, historically, ambulance service response was measured very simplistically by looking solely at the speed of response to a group of calls known as Category A, those deemed the most serious. However, this categorization was based on data from 1976, which related really only to victims of heart attacks. So there was little emphasis on other conditions requiring a timely response, and there was no assessment of the quality of care provided. In late 2019, we joined other ambulance services from the UK in adopting a new clinical response model where patients are grouped much more logically into priority of need, what we refer to as getting to the sickest quickest. Under this new system, category one, for example, is those patients who are at immediate risk of death and are the patients we most need to focus that fast response on. Category two are likewise high priority, but as we go down to category three or four, we're dealing with patients who still require an ambulance, certainly, but whose condition is less and less likely to deteriorate while waiting for one. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
We also work to send the right type of vehicle to patients from the outset. Those with no acute medical need may well receive a non-emergency transport vehicle, while those who require rapid critical interventions will receive the nearest available paramedic followed rapidly if necessary by an emergency ambulance capable of continuing the patient's care on the journey to the hospital. Now, through this, our responsiveness has clearly improved, but there is further to go. And over and above the changes we've been able to make with the resources that we presently have at our disposal. We've also been striving to work a bit smarter as well as faster through delivering or signposting patients directly to specialist services, often bypassing emergency departments. This can speed treatment for a patient overall, and it can reduce crowding in busy emergency departments, as well as being an overall better patient experience. But the net benefit is to the wider system rather than us and NIAS. Last winter, NIAS helped winter pressures by delivering far fewer patients to ED than the previous year, even though we were seeing more patients overall. But this does come at a price to NIAS and that we'll often spend more time with the patient on assessment, on treating them, and then arranging the onwards referral. Five years ago, we would have transported over 98% of our patients to the emergency department for, for care, whereas now our non-conveyance rate is around 35% because we are resolving issues for patients or directing them to something more appropriate than ED. We also regularly monitor how well our crews manage emergencies across a range of conditions such as cardiac arrest, stroke, patients with seizures, diabetic or respiratory emergencies. And we're currently in the midst of changing from a paper-based system of notes to an electronic format that will allow us to review how every individual clinician delivers care and to do that in real time. And it will also allow us to communicate more effectively by automating referrals to other services. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Nigel. Um, just following up on what both Michael and Nigel have said and recognising like much of the wider health and social care system, our service has been under significant pressure and has had to deal with a number of challenges impacting specifically on our, ser on our service. And from an, an operational perspective, these include um, the, the suspected COVID-19 calls to our emergency control room, which peaked at approximately 250 per day in April 20, which was a significant increase in the call volume that our control room was having to manage. And whilst this volume reduced in later summer months, we're currently already experiencing a steady rise in this activity with circa 150 calls per day in November 2020 compared to the previous month. And we recognise the additional pressure this places on our control room. The management of staff unavailable for operational duties due to COVID-related absences has been particularly challenging with periods of up to 20% of our staff absent at times. This results in reduced cover on shifts, which also then impacts on the reliance on overtime, which Michael has referred to, and makes rota management and shift cover um, operationally very difficult. And we have some additional staff in place to support uh, this rota management. We have noticed an increase in our call staff times since the COVID pandemic 19 when compared to the same period last year. Some of this may be attributed to the donning and doffing of PPE which adds to cycle time but of course is of paramount importance. Increased late finishes at the end of our shifts has a knock-on effect on the following shifts due to the compensatory rest and our need for meeting the working time directives. The impact of social distancing requirements um, has on our staff when they convey a patient to an ED um, and require access is recognised. There's been much discussion recently about increasing patient handover delays at emergency departments and these have a significant um, impact on our overall ambulance turnaround times that will free crews to respond to calls in the community. We recognise that the reasons for these delays are multifactorial. Social distancing requirements in EDs means that they have a reduced physical capacity to accept our patients and hospital trusts are challenged by a reduction in their bed capacity and an increased length of stay impacting on their patient flow. We have and will continue to take forward a range of measures to mitigate these impacts, including working with trust colleagues to improve the patient experience and welfare, working with departmental colleagues via the No More Silos Action Plan, specifically dedicated handover zones in emergency departments. We have increased our clinical support desk cover in the um, emergency control room. 
This um, allows us to avoid conveyance of some patients to emergency departments by either hear and treat the patients, see and treat the patients, or onward referral with a known conveyance to an emergency department. Our PCS staff and number have been redirected to a &E support. This was a decision that we took when we looked at the number of drop shifts and the, the importance of our emergency cover. Um, work, you know, working with staff to staggered shift patterns to reduce late finishes. We're very conscious of the impact managing COVID pandemic has on our staff and have a range of measures in place to support them. This includes increased management support, um, both at site at ADs and in stations to support our staff. The provision of food and where required accommodation was more relevant in the first phase of COVID when we had a significant number of staff who were um, provided with accommodation outside their own home and facilitated them remaining on duty. We have introduced some welfare clubs at emergency departments. This allows our staff to step out of a vehicle for a short period of time, remove their PPE, get some hydration, refreshment, um, and as Michael has said earlier, when they're wearing PPE over a long 12-hour period, we feel that's very important. We continue to have staff recruitment and ongoing training across a range of ambulance clinical staff. And in the last three months alone, we've recruited an additional 22 emergency medical dispatchers. Uh, this first cohort of uh, group has already started working in our control room, and the second will be in place prior to this coming Christmas, which will really support our call taking and the pressures that our control rooms are, um, are experiencing. Thanks, Rosie. Just, Chair, to, to conclude then, uh, Nigel and Rosie have talked about the actions we've been taking in the short term to provide the best possible service for patients that we can within the resources we have. But earlier this year, we published our long-term strategic plan, setting out how we plan to transform the ambulance service over the next five to six years in line with the timescale of delivering together. It was published in March uh, following approval uh, by the Minister. Uh, we sent a copy to all MLAs, so hopefully you all did receive that. Unfortunately, progress was impacted um, during the, the first half of the year uh, as a result of all of the focus on managing the, the, the pandemic, but we are keen to, to continue to progress that uh, in the year ahead. It outlines, we believe, the very significant contribution that the ambulance service has to make to the wider health service transformation agenda. I think it's fair to say that the ambulance service now is unrecognisable from what it was 10 years ago when, by and large, um, we sent out um, a couple of staff in a vehicle to pick up sick people and take them to hospital. And perhaps that's why uh, we still hear uh, inappropriately uh, our staff being referred to as ambulance drivers. Um, they're so much more than that. They are now skilled healthcare professionals providing pre-hospital care and treatment, and that was recognised um, a, a year or so ago when they uh, attained allied health professional status and joined the group of allied health professionals. They play a very significant role uh, in keeping people at home uh, and uh, contributing to there being less of a reliance on, on hospital care. Uh, we already don't transport somewhere between 30 and 35 percent of patients that we attend to. Uh, we don't convey them to hospital. We're able to resolve their issues or signpost them to an appropriate service. But we believe there's a potential to increase that. Some, some ambulance services in, in GB uh, have non convincing rates of up to 50 percent. Um, and our strategy, caring uh, today, planning for tomorrow, sets out how we plan to do that by developing new advanced specialist clinical roles, by expanding the range of alternative care pathways that we can refer patients to. And we believe that provides much better care for patients, as well as supporting the, the wider system, given the pressures it, it's under. So we see NIAS uh, as, a, a, as a key enabler to support the wider transformation agenda. We have a workforce that is eager for development, that are keen to increase their skills to do more, more for patients. And we're confident that with the planned expansion under the, the, the CRM, that that will enable us to maximise the contribution that we can make for the benefit of patients. Thank you. OK, thank you, Michael and um, Nigel and Rosie. Um, so, first question, I suppose, ne Michael, I would have, you, you had mentioned there there was a period of time between which there was no paramedics recruited. I'm also aware that there were, there's an identified need for 320 additional staff and recruitment ongoing. 
But in relation to the paramedics uh, issue, can you tell us sort of briefly why that was the case at that period of time? What impact that might have had now in terms of where we are present, and what has been done to address that issue or to bring us to bring us up to up to speed in relation to that? Um, and just in general, if I could ask, maybe uh, if members of the panel, if one member could sort of lead on an answer, and then if there's an additional piece of information or a very quick uh, anything else that members want, but if one member could sort of identify who's best, so that we get the best use out of our time. So thank you, Michael. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I'll, I'll certainly answer that. Nigel may wish to you know, to elaborate or add, given his overall responsibility for clinical training. Um, the reason that we we had that that gap was a change in the requirements for training for uh, for paramedics. Up until two thousand and fourteen, uh, most paramedics across most ambulance services were trained internally, um, a vocational training, if you like, taking your existing staff in our medic emergency medical technician tier, providing them with additional in-house training uh, in order to carry out the role of paramedic. And that has served us very well. We have very many staff in this organization. That's the way they became paramedics. And they are doing an excellent, very professional uh, job out there every day. Uh, but the HCPC changed the requirement uh, in, in 2014 uh, that um, paramedics, in order to be a registered paramedic, uh, you, you, there needed to be an increased level of qualification. And so NIAS had undertaken some work in order to, to do that uh, with, a, with a university provider that didn't actually result, didn't reach a conclusion, didn't actually reach the stage where we, we had a, a, a successful program. And so, so that's what resulted in taking slightly longer. We then formed a partnership with Ulster University, and, and there's, quite, there's, there's a lot of work involved with the university in developing our foundation degree program in paramedicine. That was approved by HCPC in um, November 2018. The first program started in January 2019, and 40 new graduate uh, paramedics um, were qualified in December last year, December 19, and obviously have now been, been working uh, for a full year. Um, we have a second cohort of student uh, paramedic students then started in January this year. Unfortunately, we had to pause that training in April, um, partly because it just wasn't possible at that early stage with the university to deliver the training in the context of uh, the pandemic and the need for social distancing. And we needed to have those staff available for operational duties. So they, their training um, did unfortunately pause from April until September. They resumed it in September. Um, we're protecting that as best when, and so far have been successful in doing that, protecting that, that those students complete their, their uh, course and will graduate in February. And we have another group of students ready then to commence straight after them in, in February. And subject to funding, we are aiming to run at least another two cohorts of student paramedics uh, through the foundation degree program with the Ulster University, ahead of the BSc program starting uh, in September next year. Uh, we, as long as we have started a foundation degree program before then, we can carry on and continue. But for after that, all new paramedics uh, will have to do a three-year uh, full BFC program uh, through Ulster University. So it, had, it, it, it did cause us an issue. There, there's no doubt about that. Uh, it has impacted on our staffing levels, but there's been a lot of work over the last couple of years to do that, uh, to, to address that, both by training our uh, student paramedics to the foundation degree, and as Rosie said, uh, recruiting graduate or qualified paramedics from other uh, ambulance services throughout uh, Britain and Ireland and indeed in some cases further afield. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, okay, the second question I suppose from me is in relation to and, and Rosie I did I did note your remarks and I have to say I'm sure every member of the committee here fully recognises and appreciates the pressure that everyone within the service, but I suppose in particular ambulance services have been, and, and similar to many of the other services, had been under pressure coming into this pandemic, and then were faced with all the additional mm -hmm. pressure that, that that brought. So I'm wondering, and I know, Rosie, that you have set out some of the supports that you have in place for staff, but in terms of tracking staff welfare, how do you measure where you know, stress and sickness levels and things like that were? Um, 
over a period of time? And, and is that worsening? And if so, what are, what are you doing to try to support those staff who are hard pressed as a result of work, as a result of disgraceful at times attacks on them, and um, mm. obviously having to work with PPE? Those are all having impacts upon them. So, could you give us an idea of your assessment of is that increasing or decreasing, and how you're going to manage that? Well, well, Chair, I just said a few introductory remarks, and then uh, we'll provide to the detail. Yep. Um, the ambulance service uh, has had a um, relatively high level of sickness compared to other health service organisations. Now, that has to be seen in the context of the nature of the job, the very physical nature and the environment they work in, and some of the issues you've said, including those um, atrocious assaults, uh, which obviously uh, on, on the more serious ones does result in people being absent from work. Um, we have seen, however, since the pandemic started, we have seen, uh, we were already seeing an improvement in, in our sick absence um, over the last um, year or so, uh, certainly the six months before the pandemic, our, due to the, the range of initiatives we were undertaking, our level of sickness was coming down uh, relatively slowly, I, I would have to say. We have seen a reduction on uh, in that, in what you would call other sickness uh, during the pandemic, um, fairly Fairly quickly, um, really in March time, when it was clear that staff were really keen to come back and play their part and support their colleagues, um, despite uh, you know, perhaps uh, how, how they felt. So we have seen a, a reduction in our general sickness, uh, if, you, if you'd like to call it that. Uh, and I believe that is in part due to some of the measures we can both more generally to support the health and well-being of our staff. What we have had, though, uh, which has made it a very challenging position, is the number of staff who are unavailable for work for COVID-related reason, uh, reasons, whether they themselves have been positive or required to self-isolate, or whether family members are and, and they've had to self-isolate uh, for that reason. So Rosie can maybe outline the, the extent of that, of the staff that we have lost through uh, reasons other than sickness and the measures then that we're putting in place to, to support them. Yes, it, um, thank you, Michael. Yes, we have experienced significant increases previously in the absence of staff due to non-COVID-related sickness. Um, as Michael said, that, that has been reducing. It can still be in, in excess of 20% of our staff at times. Um, what we're doing to support that, um, a number of measures really. Um, we have increased occupational health access to support our staff to return to work, to understand some of the reasons why they are unable to return to work um, with a case management approach. For these staff, is it perhaps alternative duties, lighter duties, looking at the, the roles and responsibilities, looking at their shift patterns, etc., and trying to support them with a better work-life balance? Because we do find that has helped. We have um, a very robust peer support um, approach for our staff. It is a small team. They're a very busy team. They're a very valued team, um, but they will make regular contact. So if we have staff who have, as Nigel said earlier, experienced a very difficult or a challenging call, be that um, a cardiac arrest, a very difficult RTC, a poor outcome, these staff are contacted directly by their station officer. Following that, they're offered some time to step down from duties. They then get a, receive a call from their peer support to discuss it, discuss the situation with them, see if a debrief would be helpful. And we have a counselling service for our staff where they are particularly challenged, the Inspire Counselling, which um, has been welcomed um, on a day-to-day -day basis. As I said, the um, challenge that our staff have when they have prolonged waits in the back of vehicles, the fact that we have a, a service where, or a provision whereby they can step out of the vehicle, but we're also making sure that they have easy access to something to eat, whether that's in the local hospital canteen by um, providing them with food vouchers, etc. And, and I think, very importantly, a, a, a managerial visibility out in stations, at emergency departments, talking to your staff. And we've had a number of engagement sessions, um, both Michael, myself, um, some of our other directors, um, with across a tier of all our staff to hear what their concerns are, to try and better understand them, to um, discuss with them any proposals that they think that they could, could take forward um, that would improve the staff experience. And we're more than willing to work with them on that. And that has been welcomed by all of our staff that we have met at those engagement sessions. Okay. 
Thank you. And the final one for me then, before I go to Deputy Chair Pam Cameron, is in relation to, you had referred there, Michael, to advanced clinical roles. And actually, I think a figure that I found um, a positive figure in relation to the 30 to 35 per cent of people who are not being transported to hospital or ED or, or things like that, not only from the point of view of, of reducing pressure on those very, very hard pressed services, but also that it's better for people not to be admitted to hospital generally in terms of infection and, and all of the other things we know go with admission to hospital, the, the, side, the side impacts of some of that. Um, and, and I do, and I am aware that other other areas are are very much using advanced practice and trying to ensure that paramedics and all staff are working to the very top of their knowledge, experience, and their their capability, and are being developed and progressing in that sense. So, when will when will the advanced clinical roles be coming into place, and what what systems are in place to ensure that all staff are able? To do those more challenging and, and more treat, and I know you refer to see and treat and hear and treat, and I think those are those are things that would be welcome in terms of the wider transformation. But um, when is that going to be a framework for that in place, or is it already there? Well, taking them forward at scale, chair is very much linked to getting the additional resources uh, set out under the new clinical response model. But I'd ask Nigel to outline more detail. He he is responsible for the development of those. Uh, Clinical, uh, both the, the, the care pathways and the, the development of clinical roles. So, Nigel, if you pick up, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Michael. Uh, and Chair, um, we do have a number of specialist roles already in place. Um, that we're, uh, I'm sure you're well aware of the, the work of the Helicopter Emergency Medical Service, where the paramedics are delivering you know, critical advanced care for, for patients with serious trauma. We also have uh, heart team paramedics, uh, hazardous area response team paramedics, who will deliver paramedic care in, in very dangerous circumstances, um, you know, up, up, up cranes, you know, down potholes, um, off cliffs, etc. Um, but we want to expand that further, and in particular, uh, we want to develop the, the notion of paramedics who will work jointly across um, emergency work with the ambulance service and also our colleagues out in primary care and in general practice in the community. Uh, and we see this as being a particular benefit um, in, in the, the more rural areas where there is lighter ambulance cover, where the, the paramedics can, can contribute significantly to uh, the, the long-term health by managing some patients who have chronic conditions. But when an emergency arrives in the community, they are there and able to, to rapidly respond to it. So we have developed the programs for these. Um, we are working again with the university provider to, to, to pin down the, the actual training and the, the modules that will, will be delivered. Um, we are we're very keen that, that we develop this program internally rather than having uh, staff just under take their own training uh, with an intention to become uh, advanced clinical care providers. Um, we want to make sure that the training they get is fit for purpose uh, and will benefit ourselves, um, the community, and in particular the patients. Um, so that, that is something that is already in progress. As Michael has highlighted, that it will be dependent upon the, the extra recruitment so that we can, if you like, divert a cohort of paramedics to the specialist care. All of our paramedics can currently deliver what we talked about in terms of hear and treat uh, and see and treat patients, referring patients to alternative care pathways to specialist clinics rather than, than bringing them to ED. That is something that is already in place for all of our frontline staff. Um, but with the specialist rules, that there will be additional training needed, uh, and that will certainly uh, involve uh, a more advanced education program and probably a master's level qualification for those small number of staff um, who are expected to provide very specialist niche care. Thank you, Nigel. And I suppose just a quick one, just, and, and I'm conscious that um, you had, or one of you had mentioned earlier about a, a negotiation for the university that hadn't come to pass, and I'm conscious, you know, that these are you're in that process now on the advanced practice. But what what is your work and target in terms of when you start to do the training for the advanced practice? Um, again, that that is dependent on the uh, the additional staff being made available. We are working with the Department of Health in, in terms of that they ask for a, additional funding for the service uh, and the, the additional number. And Michael's already mentioned the figure of around 300 extra staff. Um, I'm pleased to say that the, the department's engaging uh, very well with us in that. that our, our, our business case has been submitted to the department in terms of our, our, our request for that. Um, once that is approved, if it is 
approved, um, then we will be able to start that training almost immediately. But it will take at least a year for that to be put in place from the time we start training. Okay. Thank you. I think that's I think that's a, a positive a positive in the sense of in terms of recruitment and retention of staff. I think all staff across a range of services are keen to see that progression and that that ability to work to the very top of their of their skills. So I'm going to go I'm going to go now then to our deputy chair Pam Cameron. Go ahead, Pam. Thank you, chair. And uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much for a very comprehensive briefing, which really does highlight the. Uh, invaluable contribution of our ambulance service personnel throughout the pandemic, despite systemic staffing shortages and the high rate of COVID-related uh, absence. Um, and certainly it's a testament to the work of our ambulance crews that the response times are improving and almost 30,000 hospital handovers took place in under an hour during July to September. So that's very welcome. Um, however, obviously the p- pandemic has identified uh, inefficiencies in care pathways for those engaged by um, the ambulance service, which is causing delays in crews getting back to their core functions without queues at um, local hospitals and whatnot. You, you have answered many of my questions already, I'd be glad to know, but I wanted to ask you one around reform and another one around, a quick one around staffing. So for the reform one, um, I wanted to ask you what proportion of the current 999 calls could be dealt with uh, under uh, an urgent care centre model and how this would free um, ambulance service capacity up and how would dedicated ED ambulance receiving areas differ from the current practice. So that was the first one on reform. And then very quickly on the staffing issue, just on the back of what's already been discussed and the questions that have been answered, I wanted to ask you around you know, how we could better market a career better market a career as a paramedic to working class and marginalised communities. Um, and, and ask you if, if training routes are as accessible as they could be. Okay, thank you, Chair. I'll make a few um, comments, and um, Nigel and Rosie may wish to uh, to come in and expand on a bit on it. Uh, in relation to uh, those areas um, you, you described as reform, uh, which are you know, largely related to the uh, actions under the No More Silos Action Plan that was. Uh, published by the, the minister fairly recently, um, one of there's ten actions within that. One of those is to establish urgent care centres. That an urgent care centre has already been established in the Belfast Trust and has been in operation for for a number of weeks now. And um, th- those in in time will be linked to a related action uh, in No More Silos, uh, which is around people phoning first uh, to be advised of the most appropriate uh, place to go to and again that has started recently in a number of our emergency departments um, particularly in Antrim, Causeway, Craigavon uh, and Daisy Hill. Uh, the patients who go to the urgent care centres will by and large be the uh, the walk-in patients, those who are less ill uh, and are less likely to require an ambulance. So it, it's unlikely that we will take too many uh, patients uh, to an urgent care centre. Uh, it, it, that doesn't mean that we never will, but by and large it will be patients who uh, aren't, aren't very ill and are established not to be very ill uh, that will, will go to an urgent care centre. The, the, the intention of that being that those who really do require the level of care that you can get in an emergency department, um, there, there's more capacity for them to be taken there, including by ambulance. Uh, the, the, the action within numerous silos around establishing dedicated ambulance receiving areas, that's an action we very much welcome in the ambulance service. It is intended to address the long-standing problem about, about uh, ambulance handover delays. This isn't a new, new issue during COVID. Uh, it's been a, a challenge uh, for, for many years, but previously our staff would, accuse, would have queued in a hospital corridor with patients, they could cohort patients, not something that um, we would necessarily consider to be ideal, but it did allow um, one crew to look after maybe two or three patients, freeing up the others to respond to calls. Since the start of COVID, that has not been possible because they can't queue in a corridor for obvious reasons, therefore they're waiting uh, outside in the back uh, of an ambulance. So the action in No More Silos to have a dedicated receiving area um, is is a a really welcome improvement. It means instead of, um, certainly instead of waiting outside in an ambulance and even instead of queuing in in a corridor where there isn't um, the the appropriate environment and level of privacy, etc., each of the hospitals are required to establish a clinical area appropriately staffed 
where ambulances will be, ambulance crews will be able to take their patients directly into and that patient over appropriately, safely to the care of the emergency department staff, leave to go back out to what they should be doing is responding to other calls within the community and leave those patients in a suitable environment for, for their care to, to continue. So we very much welcome that and look forward to those being uh, fully established uh, across the region. In relation to your, your comment or your, your question about um, better marketing of career, um, absolutely. I, I think that's something we need to do more work on. We need to uh, work with the universities so over the coming years to do that. Um, Any time we recruit, we, we tend to recruit uh, when we recruit externally to our ambulance care attendant uh, level. Um, there's a huge level of interest for, for, for those jobs. I think the last time that we advertised, there was about a thousand people uh, applied for that. We also sometimes we also advertise externally for emergency medical technicians. Some of those people come from within, from the tier below. Others come externally, and again, a very high level of interest to date. Um, any recruitment to paramedics uh, have either been people already qualified who choose to come to work for us or taking our own emergency medical technicians with the experience they have and giving them additional training. That will obviously all change uh, next year whenever paramedics will be advertised like any other degree course uh, for uh, school leavers and others who wish to pursue a career. I believe it will be a very attractive one, um, but we do need to make sure we are, are uh, drawing it to the attention of people right across our, our community and attracting people with the right skills and in my view, those skills are as much about their, their personal skills or emotional skills as it is about their academic uh, qualifications. to get the right people with the right sort of skills in. And uh, it is something that we will have to give more attention to over the year ahead to, to do that. The data isn't something we've done particularly because most of our recruitment to paramedics have been from within. But as we open that externally, that is an important area we'll have to address. Uh, Rosie, if there's anything else you would add on the, the number side? I'll just say, um, uh, one in relation to the urgent care centre. And we are working with, um, in particular, the Belfast Trust, who have been the sort of first to implement their urgent care centre. And understandably, uh, as a new service, they are starting it at a scale with a view to expanding. And um, at the moment, um, the intention is, as Michael has said, that they will be for walk in patients. But with negotiation, we've already taken in the last two weeks, I think it's eight patients from uh, via ambulance to the urgent care centre. So what we've learned from that experience is that it's very important that we would agree with um, the urgent care centres what would be an acceptable patient to arrive, what would what would be a suitable condition that we could bring to straight to an urgent care centre. So that is a work in progress and it's been welcomed. In relation to the um, no more silos work and the um, ambulance handover zones, um, I think the improvement that this will bring is that this will be a dedicated ambulance handover receiving area. Previously, whilst um, emergency departments would have tried to have a dedicated space, um, more often than not, it was used by patients who self presented, but this will be protected for ambulance arrivals, which is really welcomed. And what, what we have done as part of supporting the No More Silos work is um, we have produced a set of core minimum standards for what the expectations would be for these um, handover zones, um, including, for example, clear lines of, lines of communication, clarifying who a single point of contact is, so that there's a clear communication between our ambulance crew. They know exactly who to go to when they arrive in an emergency department. And the fact that that set of standards has been written, I think it's welcomed because then it can be reasonably applied. So that consistency is welcomed. Um, and relevant staff within the areas, for example, we're, we're um, stipulating that the, the trust should consider the, the level of nursing staff, medical staff, administrative staff, um, diagnostic staff that they would need to have in that area. So um, there's, there's work to be done, undoubtedly. But we are making progress with the hospital trust. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm going to go across now on the video conferencing to Paula Bradshaw. If she's there, I'll then be going to Colin McGrath on the phone, and then I'll come back to the room here to a couple of members in the room, and then back to the phones. So, Paula, are you there with a the question? 
Uh, yes, um, uh, thank you, panel, for coming this morning. It's great to have you here. Just before I um, enter into my questions, I just want to put on record my family's thanks. My uh, father-in-law is 90, and he had to, well, the family had to call out the ambulance service about four times in November, and I have to say the professionalism and the compassion was exemplary, and I, 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 I think without fear of contradiction, we have the best ambulance service in the world, so big fans at our house. Um, my, my questions relate to the annual budget in your um, presentation, Michael. You, you said that there was a, a approximately 100 million recurring um, revenue um, funding. I'm just wondering then, to take the transformation agenda forward, what sort of funding you would need for that? And second to that, um, I think you talked about reconfigurating the estates. What would that uh, entail in terms of capital costs uh, and other modifications? Thank you. Thank you very much, um, both for your question, but also for your uh, initial comments. I'm, I'm pleased that that's your experience. I, I do know that on occasions um, that's not everybody's experience. Some people do uh, wait too long. But one thing that uh, I almost all, always hear is that whenever our staff do arrive uh, on scene, the level of care, the empathy, the, 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 uh, the kindness, the compassion they show to people uh, is first class. I, I witnessed it myself and many times when I've been out uh, with uh, with staff and, and as a user of the service, as we all are, and um, absolutely recognise what you said. So thank you uh, for that. In terms of the, the resources uh, that, that we require, um, as you say, we, we currently have a, an annual operating budget of around £100 million. Um, the, the, the uplift in staffing that we are requesting, that we believe is necessary, and indeed it has been accepted by the Department and by the Health and Social Care Board, uh, of those 320 uh, operational staff, plus there will be other support staff needed when you, when you bring an intake of uh, staff in of that scale. It is significant. Um, we currently have 1,450 staff in total. About a thousand or just over of those are, are, uh, are, are clinical uh, staff. Uh, so to be looking for and requiring an uplift of 320 more clinical staff in percentage terms is a very significant increase. I, I'm, I'm very aware of that, um, and we are probably looking for a level of increase uh, beyond what uh, other organisations uh, would be looking for. And I'm very conscious that it's a system where many, many services um, demand exceeds capacity. That's the reality of, of the growth in demand against uh, the, the challenging financial environment for, for the last um, uh, five, five plus years. So we are requiring a significant investment. The exact amount of that will be uh, determined through the business case process, but it's in the order of £30 million. Um, that, Big, big rest of those shouldn't be particularly surprising if we're needing an uplift of about a third in our staffing, uh, the, the, the finance is going with that, uh, or of a similar scale. So uh, we need a, an uplift of approximately £30 million. And um, as I say, the exact amount will be uh, finalised through the business case process. That's not an amount that we need in one go. Indeed, it's an amount that we couldn't spend in one go if we find ourselves in the highly unlikely position that um, £30 million could be made available next year. We could not spend it. Uh, the limiting factor is the ability to recruit and train staff. So we expect that that, um, that that investment is over a period of probably four, uh, four to five years, uh, taking account of workforce planning and the supply of, of staff. Uh, and that's with the external recruitment, the new uh, the paramedic BSc degree that is starting, uh, and us able to recruit and train um, staff in, in, into the other roles. So it's in that order over about four to five uh, years. And the, the, the estate, uh, the NIAS estate um, is not in a great condition. I think it would be fair, fair to say we have some excellent, we do have some excellent um, uh, facilities such as the, the new station in Balamina and Enniskillen, which really are uh, top class and the staff working there benefit from it. But we have other estate uh, that is very, very old. Uh, it is, it's where we've been able to be um, allocated accommodation by some of the other health service organisations over many years and it's not fit for purpose. Um, that was highlighted through the work of the RPIA around infection prevention and control a couple of years ago, where they recognised some of our challenges in attaining standards was linked to, to 
to the fabric of the buildings. Um, that's become even more apparent during this year when we've been uh, having to um, maintain a high, a very, the highest levels of, of hygiene in stations and trying to maintain social distancing. And um, when you've got staff coming back into a, a, an area to, to get a, a break or refreshment that can't accommodate more than two people socially distanced, that has given us uh, real challenges. So we will have a very substantial estate requirement um, both to bring our existing estate up to the standard it needs to be and to accommodate the increased number of staff uh, associated with the implementation of our clinical response model. Uh, we have plans that are set out in our uh, strategic plan to not just build more and bigger, but to do things differently. One of the lessons that we learned from our uh, infection prevention control work uh, is that we need to have dedicated staff to do the proper roles. We now have over 30 vehicle cleaning operatives. Uh, two years ago, we didn't. Two years ago, our own staff um, were expected to drop shifts, to, to, to stop doing a clinical shift and to clean the vehicles. Um, I don't believe that's an appropriate rule for highly trained clinicians who should be spending their time supporting, uh, supporting staff. But also, cleaning an ambulance is a specialist role. The staff who we have doing that uh, are, are doing it to the highest standards. Um, so we want to build on that model and move to what we call a, a make ready model, where our staff will come in, they will start their shift, they will pick up a vehicle that has already had all of the checks done uh, around lights and you know, the, the safety of the vehicle that will have been stacked with uh, or will have been stocked with all of the appropriate drugs so that the staff pick up a vehicle that's good to go, they go out, if anything happens to that vehicle during their shift, they simply drive to the nearest station, leave it and pick up the next one at the start of a queue. That's called make ready model. It is in place in other ambulance services and we, we believe that's necessary. So we are also working on an estate's business case, an estate strategy and associated business case. So I can't quantify the amount of that uh, at this stage, um, but it will be significant given the, where we're starting from and what we believe is necessary to have a, a fit for purpose um, ambulance estate to support our staff to provide the highest level of patient care for the next 10 years plus. Thank you very much, Michael. And, and please pass on my thanks to the North Down Ambulance Crew. Thank you. Thank you. I will indeed. Thank you. And moving on then to Colin McGrath on the phone. Colin, are you there? Yeah, indeed. Thanks very much, Chair. And thank you to the panel for the presentation. And just to echo some of the previous uh, contributions of support for the Ambulance Service and the wonderful work that they do, I think um, you know we're, we're very lucky uh, to have the, the, the service that we do. But uh, that, that said, and I don't want it to be seen in a negative light to the service, but I think that within our health service family right across Northern Ireland, that we need to be careful that, um, I suppose, ultimately, not dying is not considered an, a, a success indicator, um, that there needs to be much more beyond that. And I think that within... Uh, the community, there would be a substantial um, element of people who have an expectation that when they ring for an ambulance, that they get it. Um, and I know of the various cases that I would regularly uh, refer through to yourself, Michael, is often a, a similar theme of people uh, in rural communities that are being left for many, many hours uh, without an ambulance and sometimes left lying at the side of the road in streets and towns. Uh, immobilized because of the injuries that they have, but maybe been left two to three hours uh, for an ambulance to come. And that's not a success indicator, and that's the challenge uh, I know that you and your team are trying to address. But could I ask, do you capture the information um, on waiting times for ambulances within the various categories, and do you highlight whether or not they are in rural or urban areas? And, and if so, are you finding that there's a disproportionate wait uh, given to one side or the other. Hey, thanks, Colin. And uh, as you say, um, you and I communicate on quite a, a, a number of cases, and we did have challenges in the summer. 
um, particularly in and around your, your constituency, um, when we had particular difficulties in providing the, the required level of, of cover. Um, that does tend to, to move. It's not always in, in the one place, um, just taking account of circumstances and the level of staff here uh, unavailable at any point in time. Um, but I absolutely agree with your comment about not dying is, um, is not the only measure of success. Um, obviously, when our intervention saves a life, that is the best success that, that we can get. Um, but I, I, certainly, simply achieving time bans, I would agree, is not success. So, you know, in theory, if we respond uh, to a, a category two call within the time scale, that would be seen as success, even if it's a poor outcome. If we arrive two minutes late, that's seen as failure, even if there's a good outcome. So, looking only at uh, time bans and that being the, the measure of success or failure, I agree, is not the, the right measure. So we are developing a wide range of quality indicators. Um, we, we have really increased our focus on the safety and quality of our service. We have uh, recruited now and appointed in the last year a, an additional director post in the organisation, a clinical post with uh, responsibility for safety, quality and patient experience. And the director responsible for that area is developing a, a, a wide range of safety and quality indicators of how, how we really can measure the success. So I agree, somebody waiting on the side of the road for two to three hours is a terrible experience. It's not the experience that I would want for one of my family, and it's not the experience that I think uh, it should be good enough for anybody else. One of the difficulties that we have, and it's, a, it's terminology that, that, that I struggle with, um, is that for a Category 3 call, the response time is two hours, and if somebody gets an ambulance in just under two hours, um, we could find ourselves saying that we met the standard. If that's an elderly person lying in the street for two hours or slightly under, um, I don't believe that's good enough. And uh, we're doing work currently, and, and indeed we had a presentation on it this week from our, our assistant clinical director, one of Nigel's team, so Nigel Wake may wish to add to it, about uh, some plans we have to see, can we do something um, more immediate for people in those circumstances? Um, we already do have our clinicians, our paramedics in our clinical support desk, they look at calls waiting, they differentiate between a patient that's a Category 3, that it is safe for them to wait two hours, um, and a patient who's appropriately triaged as a Category 3, but due to other circumstances, for example, being outside in clement weather, that it, it is not safe. Uh, so we, we do do that. Uh, we are not always able to um, provide a response. I find it... Um, heartbreaking, I suppose, is probably the correct word when I hear of elderly people left for eight hours lying on the floor of a nursing home. Um, not good enough, simple as that. I wouldn't try to defend it and I apologise for it. But if we don't have an ambulance to, to send because they're all higher acuity calls, um, it is very difficult uh, to, to do anything about that. But that increased clinical input in our control room, being aware of those, making clinical interventions, reprioritizing, phoning back, doing welfare checks, uh, is what we is the safest thing we think we can do now until we have the resources to respond to all of the calls in the appropriate time when, when, when this simply doesn't arise. We do publish our. I, can I? I'm sorry. I just. I know we're always pressed for time, but I think you've you've gone down an avenue which is good information. But it's not the question I asked. The question that I asked was, do you keep records in terms of whether calls are in the rural area or the urban area? That, that's that's good. the rest of it was the, the the introduction, but that was the question. So, is there an answer to that just to save time? Yeah. Yes, we do. We publish our, our performance, our waiting times by each of the categories, one to five, uh, and by division. Now, we only publish it by division, which are five divisions coterminous with the trusts. We don't, um, as far as I'm aware, Rosie or Nigel can, can uh, add or correct me if needs be, uh, the, the, the information that's readily published uh, is at that division level. We don't publish it down at a lower level, but we certainly provide it to many requests, to postcode level, to yeah. district council areas, so you can see that difference between uh, rurality and indeed between areas. Nigel, do you, Nigel, do you want to add that? 
Yeah, I, I, absolutely, uh, Chair. I would confirm that we do measure the response times for all those categories. We break it down regularly, not just by division, but by, by council areas, LCG areas, etc. There is um, something of a discrepancy between urban centres and rural areas. Um, we, we, we appreciate that. Um, going back to the figures we quoted earlier for the, the Category 1 response, um, you'll see an eight-minute response to a, you know, a Category 1 call in Belfast uh, in the um, you know, the the southern division, you know, the South, South Armagh area, for example, that could be 12 minutes instead of eight minutes. Um, it's better than it was a couple of years ago, but we can do more and we could do more if we had the extra resources. Uh, plus, um, we have to look at the impact of other changes within the health services, hospital reconfigurations, etc., which means that we are often traveling longer distances to hospitals with patients. Um, and any ambulance that is traveling further clearly is less available to respond to the next emergency. Okay. Absolutely. I think that's key for our next presentation whenever we find out about the realignment of urgent care centres and, and emergency departments. Um, is, is it true that um, the time that ambulances spend outside an emergency department waiting does not count towards the time that that person is listed as being within an emergency department waiting and therefore the waiting times don't include the, the time that is spent in an ambulance parked outside. I hear often of a line in the door that wants the patient to pay that that's where actually the time starts for the hospital side. Is that the case? Historically, uh, that might have been the case. Uh, we, we are... Nigel, just sorry for interrupting. Could I get a brief answer on that, please? And could I ask yep. uh, both right. members, I'm conscious of time, as Colin has said, both members and the panel, and all the information that's being shared is actually hugely valuable and welcome, but if we could get direct answers and, and fairly succinct, please. Thank you. Okay. Um, his, uh, Chair, thank you. Historically, that would have been the case. However, we are very clear, and indeed we're very grateful for confirmation from the permanent secretary locally, and also from the, the head of the NHS uh, in England, that it is clear that once an ambulance arrives at a hospital emergency department, that patient is the responsibility of the hospital. It makes a nonsense for us to race out to a patient, race back to hospital with blue lights as quickly as we can, and then sit for anything up to 12 hours outside that emergency department. We have now got agreement that the arrival time at hospital um, is the, the, the time that is used by both the hospital and ourselves. We are now confirming that uh, the patient is registered on the hospital system by our staff as soon as they arrive. So they are visible to the hospital system, as it were, uh, and, and the, the clock is already ticking. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to come back into the, the chamber here to Jonathan, and then I'll be going back on the phone to Pat Sheehan. Go ahead, John. Thanks, Chair. And, and I'd share the, the other members' comments in relation to the valuable contribution from the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service, uh, in particular, throughout the COVID-19 period. Um, I would be interested to hear, are you, uh, is the Ambulance Service noticing any major reduction in uh, those with cardiac or lung symptoms, uh, seeking urgent assistance, perhaps fearful of COVID, etc.? Uh, so that would be my first point. I would also like to know that the number of handovers from your briefing taking more than one hour rose between July and September compared to that of last year. Roughly what proportion of these, in those, sorry, these in, uh, involve a patient waiting on an in, um, inpatient bed? Nigel, do you want to uh, ask the first question? I, I was going to say, if I take the, the first uh, in the early... Uh, stages of the, the COVID pandemic, we saw a dramatic drop in activity. Um, patients were fearful uh, of contacting the ambulance service. Uh, and it was helpful in some ways in that it gave us the opportunity to, to, to respond to the other challenges at that time. But over the past couple of months, we have seen all the regular work coming back, um, plus the additional work we normally see at this time of year, the winter pressures. Um, so the, the workload is significantly increasing. Uh, and we, like all of the other uh, ambulance services in the UK and indeed the, the, the Republic of Ireland, um, have put in special tools in our control room to try and pick out those patients who are phoning us who are displaced symptoms likely to represent COVID. First of all, to alert our crews to that uh, likelihood, uh, and also that we can ensure that they are brought to the most appropriate hospital if it is felt that they are suffering COVID. And on the second uh, issue that, that Jonathan raised about patients who are waiting, um, it, it's difficult to, to uh, determine, for us to determine whether they will need a bed or not until that assessment is taken in, in ED. But Rosie? Yeah, just, just, I was just going to exactly say what Michael had said. It's not possible to say if that patient has been waiting. If they're waiting, for example, over an hour, it, it is because they need a bed because they have not been triaged by the emergency department staff. 
um, and have had no sort of definitive diagnosis um, to determine whether they need to be admitted or not. Um, but uh, what I would say is the, the patient flow within the hospital, whereby they do not have available beds, means that they're not the trusts are not in a position to bring our patients in from ambulances. So whilst we cannot categorically say those delays are directly related to somebody who needs to be admitted, the fact that the trusts are experiencing challenges with their bed capacity is why the patients are waiting that length of time. So they wouldn't all necessarily be admitted. I suppose it's interesting to hear um, the, the difficulties that were faced at the beginning of, of COVID-19 and how the ambulance service have had to adapt to that. And I, I take that because I actually have a, a personal case, which I will go, go into detail uh, privately with Michael in relation to the ambulance crew arriving, uh, somebody displaying symptoms, but they, but they weren't symptoms, they were genuine medical uh, emergency. And the length of time it took for ambulance crews to decipher which hospital that, and that patient would go to. The, the briefing refers to an agreed process to release crews to respond to Category 1 calls. How does that operate in practice, and how, are, how is a patient's clinical needs addressed and judgment made on who actually takes priority? Okay, so uh, that, that the release of those crews, that is one of the pieces of work that has um, come out of the No More Silos work and that is one of the core standards that we have built into the proposal for um, trust to deliver. Um, once the core standards were um, developed, Michael then wrote out to all the trust chief executives to explain how we would manage that process. So how that process works for us as an ambulance service is if our control room receive a category one call for a certain location and we do not have a resource readily available to dispatch to that call, uh, we our control room then makes a call to the emergency department to what they call their red phone, their standby phone, which is the most instantly answered phone, um, with a, to inform the emergency department that we have a potentially life-threatening category one call in their location. We do not have a resource available and we are asking that they would um, review the patients who are waiting outside their emergency departments to identify who is most appropriate for them to create a space urgently to take that patient in so our crews can be released. I, I would just add to, to, to that, uh, Jonathan, that I have to say all of our trust colleagues have been hugely supportive yeah. in that when there's been a lot of discussion on the challenge of ambulance overs, the particular risk that somebody who is life-threatening a Category 1 call and there's no ambulance available, there was no issue whatsoever with the other trust agreeing a process to release a crew immediately to respond to that. So it's been, uh, it, it was a lot of support from, from our other trusts and we do not expect there to be a problem with that. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Going then back on the video conference into Pat Sheehan. Go ahead, Pat. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, and uh, uh, Michael, you'll be aware that uh, we're constantly hearing stories about lack of ambulance cover in all the trusts, uh, about lengthy waiting times for ambulances to come and pick up sick people and so on. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering that. And I, I, this this could be a bit, be, maybe a bit repetitive going back on the questions Paula was asking. But when I last met you about 15 months ago in your own office, uh, you told me at that time that you had a, submitted a business case. In fact, it had been submitted for a, a quite a considerable period of time with the department and you were waiting a response. And that business case was about investment in the ambulance service. So I'm just wondering, could you remind me uh, exactly what amounts the ambulance service were asking for at that time and what areas was the investment going into? And it it hey, Michael, sorry to uh, interrupt you. What, what exactly happened to that business case? Thanks. It's sorry, Pat, I think there's a wee bit of a delay on the, the, the lines. Apologies for jumping in there. Um, We've met it. We've met a, a number of times. Um, so I, I can't quite recall the the, the, uh, the position fifteen months ago um, because we we did not have the business case at, at that stage. It was in in August two thousand and nineteen. Uh, the department approved 
the introduction of the new uh, CRM code sets that Nigel described, moving away from the old category A, B, C to the new categories one, two, three that are much more um, accurately targeted at, at clinical need. The department uh, agreed uh, or approved the introduction of that in, in August 19. It was implemented in November. 19 and they asked us to produce a business case uh, so the first stage of that is a strategic outline case we submitted that to the department in february uh, of this year and there was the normal engagement that takes place between uh, any uh, arm's length body and the department in relation to the detail of that you know they, they require clarification points we provided uh, that and some of that i think was impacted in terms of the progress on being able to do that rapidly some of that was impacted on both sides with ourselves and the department on the the, the COVID situation we put that in in february and uh, we were all in a very different world in march we then resubmitted um the, the uh, a revised strategic outline case to the department um, in september uh, of this year and there is that ongoing uh, dialogue, but my understanding is we expect to hear an outcome of that uh, reasonably soon, and we hope that's a uh, uh, sufficient outcome for us to move to the next stage of, of the business case process. In terms of the, uh, you, you also asked in, in what, what was in it. Um, it, it, so there's the 325 additional clinical staff that we need. Um, there is, in order to bring in that number of additional staff, there's clearly a need to also have uh, more HR staff, more IT staff, more finance staff, uh, more governance staff, so a range of other support staff to support an increase of a third uh, in an organisation. So that's included, and it's included within those amounts that I said earlier broadly in, in the order, order of uh, 30 million pounds, but the exact amount being worked through uh, on a business case. Um, and then uh, there, there's also the fleet and estate uh, elements of that. But initially, the work that we were doing initially and the priority with the business case is for the increased staffing. So we're, we're hopeful that we will hear a positive outcome of that soon and it allows us to move to the next stage. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, could I just come back in on that, Chair? Um, well, we have, we, we're going to have to have a difference of opinion about what took place at that meeting. And my, my recollection was that it was on the uh, August bank holiday uh, in 2019. Uh, and uh, it, it's unlikely I would have conjured up in my own mind that I was told a business case had been submitted and you were waiting on a response. And... I, I, I'm not getting into an argument with you about that, uh, but certainly uh, the delay in providing investment to the ambulance service is creating problems in the system. Uh, we had reports from the, the southern area that there was a severe shortage of ambulances, ambulance cover recently within the last week or two weeks. Uh, we're regularly hearing from uh, ambulance staff in Belfast about shortages. And while the, the, the investment isn't going into the ambulance service, how can we expect these difficulties and problems to be resolved? Yeah, briefly on that, Michael, please. Yeah, and, and certainly, Pat, if there was any misunderstanding or if, if I didn't communicate the position clearly at that stage, uh, I, I apologise for that. We, we, we did the consultation on the new clinical response model in the early part of 2019. Um, so that was a, a public consultation and, and the various invested groups. Yes, Mike, so sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Yes, I, I know about the clinical response model. In fact, the, the meeting... Uh, at that time was to discuss the rollout of that. So, I mean, there's no there's no issue about that. Well, the, the business case came out. We had to get approval from the department on the model to then start the business case process. But as I say, if that was not made clear at, at the time, uh, I apologise for, for that. Um, the priority for us now is getting uh, an outcome to that business case and hopefully confirmation of additional funding uh, to allow us to continue our recruitment and training programme and indeed to uh, speed that up in, in terms of numbers. In the meantime, um, some of the... the 
issues that were the actions we're taking in the meantime to try to improve performance are largely those that have already been outlined. We are recruiting and training as many staff as we can, and currently funding is not holding that back because we've been allocated substantial amounts of non-recurrent funding from the department from the previously transformation funding and more recently this year through monitoring rounds so we have been being allocated uh, additional money to allow us to train and recruit as many staff uh, as we can the challenge that we faced this year is uh, we have more staff out due to covid related reasons than we are able to recruit and, and train staff so um, it, 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 uh, Trying to make progress in the current context. Um, the, the issues around problems in particular area, you mentioned the, the southern, uh, those issues emerge. And I, I met you and some of your, your colleagues not that long ago in relation to similar ch uh, challenges in Belfast. Um, we manage, and Ro Rosie and her team manages that on a day to day basis. That, that is the job. They are looking every shift, every day, every night. In the, in the couple of weeks ahead and looking at how we can move staff around to fill gaps, how we can bring in additional voluntaries and private providers. Um, and we do manage the service as a single regional service. Although our staff are based in divisions and we monitor performance by divisions, if a particular division is light, that does not mean that the people living in that area um, will suffer disproportionately in terms of a response, we will send the nearest available ambulance and most of our ambulances, I'm sure you've heard it from uh, from constituents, most of our ambulances will work in all areas and people will often say, how come someone living in Belfast got an ambulance from Craigavon? If that was the nearest available one, if a crew from Craigavon comes and does a call to the Royal, they will be sent to the next available call wherever that is and they may not return to that area and we have peaked their original area and we have that ongoing movement on a day-to-day -day basis to try to equalize the pressures and provide everyone with a, with as consistent a, a response as possible okay thank you i'm yeah. um, going then to Orlea. yep thank you and thanks to michael nigel and um rosie and i just want to begin by um commending the the ambulance service um in particular for the the work that they've took part in um, with the, around the mental health multi-agency triage team. I know that I've met with the ambulance service and with the, the PSNA separately and together on that project. Um, and I know that um, both organisations are, are keen to see um, that triage team, um, you know, extended past the, I know it's only operating in the Belfast Trust and the South Eastern Trust at the moment for two nights a week. Um, but by all accounts, it's um, all the feedback from it has been that it, it's it's been working really well. So just thanks to the ambulance service for taking part in in that. Um, my first question is maybe just a follow on from some of the comments Michael had made there um, in response to Pat around the funding. Um, so I was just wondering, um, Michael or Nigel or Rosie, in the context of the issues that the the service has faced. Um, with the, the COVID uh, pandemic. What additional um, money or funds has your service received then over the past, I suppose, 10 months? Because I'm conscious the department has obviously had separate money for COVID. I know, Michael, you have mentioned the monitoring rounds as well. So what additional monies have you received and are you as content that that's been sufficed? That's my first question. Okay, thanks for that, Gloria. And, um Yes, uh, we have received significant additional funding from the Department of Health. Um, I have to say, funding has not gotten in the way of anything that we have done or not been able to do uh, over the, the last uh, 10 months. Um, the message has been clear from the Department from the outset that we should take whatever actions we need to do to provide the best possible response uh, that we have. So there's been a high degree of confidence that if we were um, in putting in, this, in place additional measures that cost money, that that funding uh, w would follow and that, that has continued to be the case. It's a very live process. We, um, like all of the trusts, uh, regularly submit uh, details of both our spend to date and our forecast spend. That's obviously a very moving position as second surge came and um, not quite all not quite clear uh, of how the next few months will look, but they're certainly going to be difficult. Um, all I can assure you is that uh, funding has not stopped us doing anything to date. We have received in the order of about, of about an additional £12 million uh, related to COVID pressures. Um, or, or that, that, that's the, the forecast for our year to date, uh, sorry, our, our overall year. That's the forecast of the additional money that NIAS will need to respond to COVID pressures in the order of about £12 million. And uh, we uh, expect, and from our discussions with the department, we are confident that that, uh, that funding will be provided. 
Michael, thank you very much, and, and that, that's that's good to know that, that that's not a major issue for you. Um, and just quickly, my second question is around um, in in the I'm not sure it was the briefing paper a uh, uh, um, uh, written um, response from the minister, but um, you you have referred to using um, private ambulance services to help support you whenever your own service is under pressure. I'm just wondering if you could elaborate a wee bit on that. Maybe just explain what additional cost um, does those private services bring to the, the public purse, if, if you're over that detail. Thank you. OK, well, we would, for years, we have used um, voluntary ambulance providers and private ambulance providers to, to supplement our capacity. We target those at the lower acuity calls, freeing up our staff to uh, respond to, to the higher acuity calls. So we will have had an element of spend um, for quite some time uh, on that. Some of that comes from um, vacancies uh, we would have had in our own service. So if we don't have all of the staff we need, we're using the money that would have paid staff to pay for that service. Uh, and our approach is very much to recruit and employ our own staff and have less reliance on, the, on those providers. Um, but over the last year, uh, whenever we've had the large numbers of staff not available that Rosie's already outlined for COVID-related reasons, uh, we have significantly increased the amount of voluntaries and privates that we've used, uh, and the cost of that is within that additional funding that we would have bid to the department for and that we have, have received. Okay, thank you, Michael. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, um, Jerry. Thanks. Uh, I suppose the NIAS have the unfortunate label of being the only uh, health trust to be ever placed in special measures by the department. And my understanding is it took three years uh, for NIAS to come into compliance with RQIA um, and some of the measures identified related to infection prevention and control, governance issues. And I think they were only addressed because NIAS asked for more time. So my first question would be what assurances um, can the directors give the public that our ambulances were clean? and proper uh, infection prevention measures were carried out from March 2020 20, right through the pandemic, and if uh, paramedic drivers had enough time to clean the, the ambulances. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Well, as, as I said a while ago, paramedics should not be uh, doing the, the in-depth clean of ambulances. We have dedicated vehicle cleaning operatives to do that. Um, paramedics and EMTs uh, and care attendants do wipe downs in between patients, as would happen in any healthcare setting. But the deep cleaning is done by a dedicated and very professional team of vehicle cleaning operatives. Um, NIOS was uh, placed in a particular special measure. We weren't put in special measures as an organisation, and, and I don't want to, uh, this to be like semantics, but we were put in a, a particular special measure in relation to infection prevention and control in March 2018 that required us to take a range of measures to, to reach compliance, uh, compliant with the standards set by RQIA. That was a huge programme of, of work. Um, involving um, physical changes that had to be made to stations, requiring capital works that had to be made, requiring every member of staff in the organisation to be trained uh, in uh, issues around infection prevention control. Some of this is, are, some of these are cultural issues, that it's not just a case of writing a letter and saying this is what you need to do. There needs to be ongoing reminders. So huge progress has been made. We, there were a number of improvement notice, notice, notices placed on us by RQIA most of those were re, uh, were lifted um, by uh, the end of last year. One of them remained in relation to uh, having a, an effective training strategy for IPC. Uh, that has now also been removed, and, and uh, the permanent secretary, of the Department of Health, has written to me um, uh, noting the progress that has been made. That we are now fully compliant, and that we are no longer in that special measure. That's very welcome, but it's testament to a hard, hard work by a lot of people right across the organisation, and importantly, all staff working in the organisation taking the measures that they need to be. So um, I welcome the improvements being made, uh, and I'm confident we'll continue to, to maintain those standards moving forward. OK, I think it would be useful for that to be shared to the committee, uh, because I think there's been no publicly available RQIA reports from, from March 2020. Uh, I think also there's a concern about value for money, because uh, my understanding is that the combined salary of the directors uh, in front of us, although we can't see you now, the screen's gone off, uh, is £300,000 combined. 
uh, and all but one director received a salary of up to, uh, sorry, a uh, bonus, uh, somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 pounds, despite NIAS being in a uh, special measure. So a question I would ask about value uh, for money is why is it bonuses for directors, uh, but not for paramedics? How can you justify that? I'd like to be very, very clear, Jerry, on this for the record. There are no bonuses. I think that must be the way that that is reflected in the annual accounts in relation to the breakdown of pay or perhaps pensions. But I'd be absolutely clear, and I'm very, very confident that uh, no directors in the organisation has received, received any bonuses. Uh, they receive their straight pay, which is a matter of public record. It's in the annual accounts. OK. Thank you. Moving on then, finally, to Alan. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, just in uh, relation to uh, sort of a logistical prob uh, a question, um, I assume that it's a shortage of crews at the moment that uh, presents the biggest difficulty rather than a shortage of vehicles. Um, and I'm wondering, we, we are really in unusual and, and difficult times and all sectors of the health service are having to innovate and, and do things maybe differently. But are there, um, I'm assuming at the moment that the crews on an ambulance are both uh, trained, fully trained paramedics. Um, are there ethical or legal reasons why that has to be the case? Or would it be possible for you to deploy a vehicle with just one paramedic and one driver uh, who may only be a first aider? Uh, and the other thing I wanted to ask the panel was just to put into context the challenge faced by the ambulance service during the, uh, the pandemic. How would you describe the state of the ambulance service uh, pre-COVID? Okay, thanks. Uh, I'll, um, I'll ask Nigel uh, to pick up on the issues in relation to the, the, um, the, the staff who respond to calls. But you, just on, on your assumption, it is a correct assumption. Uh, our, our challenge is any day of the week are having enough staff to respond to calls. It's not vehicles. Vehicles are not the issue. Vehicles are, are, are easily come by. Uh, we have a very good fleet, I have to say, and uh, we have no vehicles over five years old, uh, which would be the envy of many ambulance services. So we, we have a, a very good fleet. Our issue is having enough uh, staff to go out and respond with the right skills. But I'll ask Nigel to pick up that particular point, please. Okay, thank you, Michael, and, and to the chair, if I may. Um, it's not true that our emergency double crewed ambulances have two paramedics on board. Um, they, they have typically one paramedic and one emergency medical technician. The difference being that the paramedic has a higher skill set, can deliver more uh, advanced interventions, intravenous drugs, um, intubation, etc., for, for the critical patients. Um, we do strive to have a paramedic on every single emergency ambulance so that no matter what emergency they respond to, and you know, let's be honest, when the next call comes in, we can never predict what that's going to be for any given crew. So we strive to have a paramedic on every single emergency ambulance so that no matter what they go to, they can deliver the full range of care. We did look a number of years ago uh, at the potential for um, putting a lesser skilled um, partner on the ambulance along with a paramedic, uh, somebody I mean, described as a driver, but, but somebody who, yes, can undertake emergency driving and also assist with manual lifting and handling of patients, etc. Um, but on safety grounds, we moved away from that because um, there are a significant number of calls where a single double crewed ambulance will attend where the interventions require two people who have more than that, you know, that, that, that skill set. The emergency medical technicians are a very valuable resource for the organization. They are very highly trained. Uh, there, there's not a lot separating them from, from the paramedics, but there are many calls they attend where the, the combined skill set of both is needed. Okay. Okay, thank you. And thank you to our... Thank you. Asked, sorry, Alan. Sorry, the other question I asked was if the panel could maybe... And it's not a criticism of the ambulance service, but just to put into context the challenges that they faced during the pandemic, could they describe the state of the ambulance service pre-COVID? Yep. Alan, can I, can I ask you maybe just to, to clarify what, what do you mean by the state of the ambulance? Do you mean um, the performance, response, yes, do you mean staff the, morale? Just, just the, the, the performance, the, the staff availability, morale maybe of staff. But just your, your general uh, your general condition at that particular time. Fairly succinct, please, Michael. Um, 
I think it's fair to say um, that, um, that the ambulance services face considerable challenges. Um, our our uh, repeated staff surveys would show us that our staff have for some time ha had concerns. That's an issue we are taking very seriously. We are doing a lot of work to address organisational culture. We do a lot of engagement with staff. Um, that's more difficult now, so it's all virtual, which um, isn't quite as good as getting out to meet them. Um, but we've got a highly motivated uh, group of staff whose absolute priority is to provide uh, patient care. They do that to the highest standards on a day and daily basis. They did it before COVID. They're doing it now during COVID. And they have many challenges in doing that. We believe we're aware of them. We engage with them to understand them, and we, and we try to address them. And I'm confident that moving forward, we will and move, continue to progress the ambulance service to an organisation where everybody working in it feels valued and is proud to work for the organisation and knows they're doing a superb job that's valued by every member of the community. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to our panel this morning for coming along and for, for providing your presentation and the question and answer session with members. We appreciate that. And on behalf of the committee, I would like to wish you and every one of your frontline and, and support staff who are working so hard and who have struggled along with other health staff at this time, um, all the very best in coming into what could be a very difficult winter period. And to just once again reiterate the message to the public to please try to reduce your contacts in order to reduce pressure on services. Um, so thank you very much and good luck in the time ahead. Almore, August Nolig, Hana Dave, a happy Christmas to you and your staff. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank Members, you. I'm going to take a short thank break you. now and I'll come back. I'll come back, Jerry, and then I'm going to take a short break now. I'll come back at the start of the next session uh, in relation to that. But I'm taking a short break now. And could we come back please at eleven ten to resume? Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber program. Okay, members, thank you and welcome back. And just at the end of that session, Jerry, you were looking to raise a point there in yes, relation to the ambulance uh, service yes, session. Thanks, Jerry. Just um, it was mentioned about a, a letter I think was sent from the permanent secretary in relation to the infection control measures being I think dealt with. Um, slightly paraphrasing there, I know, but can we request that that is uh, made available to the committee from the NIAS, please? Yep. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, members, thanks for that. We are now moving on to our second presentation this morning. And this is a departmental briefing into the review of urgent and emergency care. I can advise members that departmental officials are here this morning to brief the committee on the review of urgent and emergency care. I refer you there, members, to tab six of your pack and table papers. I would now like to welcome by video link Dr. Margaret O'Brien, Head of General Medical Services, Health and Social Care. Um, good morning, Margaret. Are you there with us? Okay. Yes, morning. Morning. Yes. Thank you. Dr. John Maxwell, Clinical Lead, Urgent and Emergency Care Review from the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust. Uh, are you there with us, Dr. John Maxwell? Uh, yes. Thank I you. Indeed. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Chris Matthews, who is Director of Primary Care within the Department of Health. Good morning, Chris. Are you hearing us okay? Hello, yes, I can hear you. Uh, thank you. And Mr. Alistair Campbell, who is Director of Hospital Service Reform within the Department of Health. Um, are you able to hear us there okay, Alistair? Yes, I can hear you fine, thanks. Okay. So thank you all very much this morning for coming to the committee. We are very much looking forward to your briefing, and we will then go into a question and answer session. So I'd like to invite you now to go ahead. Um, is it yourself leading, Dr. O'Brien, in relation to the, the presentations? I think it's probably Alistair and Chris who, who would want to uh, start. OK, so we'll go across to Alistair then, is it, or, or Chris. Whichever of you are leading, please go ahead. Uh, I'm happy enough to kick off if that suits you, Chris. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. You've got so I won't I won't say very much, and I'll leave it for uh, John and Margaret to give a bit more detail. But just uh, to give you a bit of background before we start, so the the work we're talking to you today is a number of different pieces of work coming together at the same time. Really, um, one element is the review of urgent and emergency care, and another is response to the pandemic and some um, different ways of working that we'll find, uh, which Chris and Margaret will say more about in primary Alistair, care. Alistair, sorry, sorry to interrupt you there, Alistair. You're a wee bit hard to hear. If you can maybe move it, turn your volume up or move a little closer. And if I could just ask all the other members, when you're not, a, when you're not speaking, if you could keep your phone on mute. So we could hear you okay, Alistair, but it's a wee bit hard to pick up, so just a little bit louder, please. Thank you. 
So I was trying uh, headphones. Is that better, just through the speaker of the iPad? Yeah, I think that's better, yeah. Cool, yeah. Uh, so just to give some background to the review then, there's um, other pieces of work from primary care, which Chris and Margaret will talk about more. But the, the review itself was started in 2018, and the committee will be aware that it was one of the program of service reviews that were being carried forward under Vengoa and Delivering Together. Um, urgent and emergency care was one of the real priority areas. Um, I think probably doesn't need any explanation why the pressures at emergency departments have been very well reported in recent years. And we've seen, uh, usually at winter, but often at other times of the year as well, crowded emergency departments and uh, long um, waits for patients and long queues of ambulances outside EDs. So just to give you some numbers, um, from 2008 to 2018, the number of patients spending more than four hours in EDs has quadrupled. And perhaps even more strikingly, um, if we look at 2009, 2010, there were about 4,000 patients waiting more than 12 hours. But 10 years later, in 1920, this has risen to 45,000, which actually equates to almost 5% of the total number of people attending EDs. So it is a fairly dramatic shift. Um, I think there is an acceptance across the piece um, that we absolutely need to reform, and that if we don't reform, we're accepting that waiting times will increase and EDs are going to become ever more crowded. The demographic challenges we face mean that there's likely to be more older people coming, and older people are more likely to attend ED and more likely to be admitted, and also more likely to be waiting 12 hours in EDs. Um, so the pandemic has also put a lot of this into sharp focus. We've been lucky, really, on the secondary care side that we've done an awful lot of thinking in the last two years through John's work um, as to what actions we might need to take. And then whenever we were hit with the pandemic, we were in a good position to put some actions in very quickly. <coughs> these are covered in the No More Silos piece, um, which is published on the department's website, which sends out 10 actions um, across primary community and secondary care um, to try and maintain and keep services safe during the pandemic. Um, the, each of the actions is important, but it's perhaps even more important is the concept behind this, which is closer working between the three different areas, between community primary and secondary, um, and better ways of working that avoids the, um, the, the blockage that the ED has become in patients' pathways. The actions also that we've put in for the immediate term are fully consistent with the work of the review. Um, which we hope to publish very shortly. So we're, we're planning, we've been a bit delayed by the fact that we've been responding to the pandemic for some time now, but the, uh, we're hoping still to publish the full review in January and move to full public consultation on that. So that's, that's our timescale for the overall review. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And are we hearing anything further then from Chris or any of the other panel members? Yes, I was just going to say um, a little bit from the primary care perspective, sort of talk about the entry point for uh, primary care and all of this. Um, so, uh, I mean, even in the days of the urgent care review, we've been talking Sorry, the uh, primary care side would play in there. We, we, we're lost you there, Chris. It's, it's a bit, it's breaking up a little bit. Just. Um... Oh, sorry. Um, are, are all are general. all other are all other members on mute, or do you have headphones, Chris, that you can maybe try? I think we've lost Chris there at this point in time. Um, Margaret, while we're trying to get Chris back online, can you advise if there's any other um, presentation element from yourself or anyone else there this morning? Yes, yeah, I think we've lost. Um, so I'm just going to take a short pause to ask broadcasting right. to check the, the technical um, issues. I suppose uh, our journey started. Uh, oh. Dr. O'Brien, we, we didn't hear the start of your. We're, Sorry. We're, we're only starting to hear you there now. So could you start again there, Dr. O'Brien, please? Yes, yes. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, that's that's better now. Thank you. Yeah, apologies. I don't think you can see me. Um, my video doesn't seem to be picking up. Oh, there's Chris back. Chris, do you want to come in and then I'll... Great. Can, can you hear me now okay? Yes, faintly as well, Chris, if you can just speak up as clearly and as, <laughs> as, uh, as clearly as possible. Thank you. Okay. So I just wanted to say something very briefly about um, the approach we're taking based on the learning we had in the first wave of the pandemic uh, and primarily from the experiences we had in setting up the uh, primary care COVID centres. 
So um, really out of necessity, we had to develop um, a sort of a network approach to delivering um, the 11 and now 10 uh, COVID centers, um, which meant a completely sort of different approach to implementation and, and how we uh, networked out to the front line and how we dealt with sort of problems and feedback coming. Um, and it, it was really sort of a powerful learning experience for us because it, it showed us how a sort of a different way of working between first of all primary and secondary care but also then between the center and the front line um, and what we found um, was that pushing out a lot of empowerment to the front line allowed us to solve problems much more quickly but also um, that those those solutions developed at local level match the need in that area much more effectively than anything that we would have come up with at the center and tried to push out. Um, so we had a really sort of a good dynamic relationship between the center and the front line. Um, and so when we came to talk about uh, what became normal silos, um, as Alistair said, it was primarily around um, preparing for the winter and the issues that we knew were gonna come with um, winter pressures and the need to social distance. Um, but when we thought about, well, how are we going to implement this so quickly? We took the lessons that we learned from getting the COVID centers up so rapidly. And then that's how we then designed the implementation arrangements for normal silos. So they do look a bit different from the kind of traditional way in which we deliver business. Um, but actually, um, from our perspective, they've been ex um, extremely effective, uh, both in terms of making sure that local needs are taken account of, but also in terms of the speed with which um, the system is able to respond to issues as they come up. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chris. And then, uh, we, are you finished there, Chris, at that? Yep. Uh, Mar uh, Margaret, can you, uh, can you come back in there then? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. I, I think uh, John wants to come in first and then I'll follow up. So I think John's going to start by taking this through some of the the, the key elements and the key actions, and then I'll, I'll come in behind that in respect to the primary care aspect of it. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Go uh, ahead, John. No problem at all. Can you hear me fine there? Yeah. Yes, we're hearing you there, John. I'm wish to hear you. Yeah. Thank you. You're never quite sure where video likes. It becomes difficult sometimes these days. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, look, uh, Alistair's already sort of set the context for um, uh, much of this. There really was a situation in emergency departments where uh, we couldn't continue uh, as we were going. Uh, it wasn't fair on the users, it wasn't fair on the, the people, it wasn't fair on the staff, uh, and really isn't wasn't fair on our population. Um, both in terms of the four-hour performance, which had gradually deteriorated over 10 years, the 12-hour performance, which clearly had become uh, much worse over three years. And of course, on the background of this was a population needs assessment, which took us up to 2026, uh, 2030 really, in terms of planning for a long-term view of what we do to create really one of the best um, urgent emergency care systems that we can, um, hopefully, uh, uh, in, uh, in Europe and indeed the world um, to deliver the best care possible for patients. Um, as you know, we were uh, a sort of a year into it, a year and a bit into it, and of course we're hit with a pandemic, which all did a lot of things in terms of stalled a lot of what we were doing in terms of initial consultations and papers to go out uh, last year uh, in the new year. However, actually gave a lot of impetus in driving things forward in terms of uh, being able to do things rapidly that needed done because of uh, an emergency in terms of COVID and not being able to have crowded emergency departments uh, because of risk of infection. So it gave an opportunity to implement some of the key recommendations. Um, as you know, this was uh, and is uh, a long-term thing as well as short and medium term. Uh, so we do need to think where we want to be in the future. Uh, the review itself, uh, we. Uh, addressed and spoke to many uh, many areas, engaged with, with many people. As you know, there was a healthcare summit last year, uh, looking at various aspects of it. We engaged with universities, uh, training agencies, especially networks, professional bodies. One of the, the most important uh, groups that we engaged with was the unscheduled care user group uh, and the people who really uh, told us what they wanted from an urgent and emergency care system and service. 
Uh, so much of this, and indeed an entire chapter of the review, describes how the users got to really say, uh, users, patients, carers, got to say what they wanted of a system and the problems that lay within the system. Uh, uh, so they, they had some very interesting and important things to say around that. Uh, um, now, in terms of the, the task and finish groups, we put together urgent emergency care, mental health, older people, um, pediatric groups were clinical task and finish groups, each which came up with their reports and reviews at the end of last year, as well as looking across workforce, user and carer groups, which were the enabling uh, task and finish groups, which worked across the, the entire piece. Um, key themes that came out of it, which I should mention, um, where users and carers talked about accessibility. They were tired of not having accessibility to a system. The first subject they came up with them was they were tired and fed up with having only an emergency department to go to. Um, and they were tired and fed up. One of the first users said to me, look, we are constantly made to feel guilty that the emergency department is the only, uh, that we're not allowed to go to it. We're told choose well, but you're not giving us other choices. Um, we look over and we see the rest of the UK has different choices to go to. They have different centers to, to visit. If they have an urgent problem, they don't have to go to an emergency department. But we understand you're very busy seeing emergencies, traumas, heart attacks. But I worry about my headache. And is it a brain tumor? Have I bled into my brain? Is something wrong with it? Uh, is something wrong with me? But I'm told to choose well and not go there. So they wanted something more in terms of the accessibility to the right person first time. They didn't want to sit in an emergency department for hours and hours. And um, the other subject came up was coordination was a big area and a big theme uh, that they were interested in. And they said, look, we want to coordinate the system, one that works regionally, one that has a network of urgent emergency care that allows us to get the service we need quickly and allows us access. And at the minute, they felt it wasn't coordinated. And um, the other thing, topic that came up amongst everybody was standardization and standardizing what we do, um, whether we're CAUs, DAUs, uh, MAUs, lots of three letters of abbreviation for everything that doctors, nurses, and patients themselves didn't fully understand. And of course, one of the biggest themes that came up, and it has really named our uh, our new network and indeed the report for silos, silos and barriers to communication. The biggest theme showed there were silos throughout the system. People didn't talk, primary, secondary care, and as Alistair has already alluded to, one of the biggest things that this network has achieved is actually people talking together and groups coming together to form solutions around the patients and not about individual areas and their interests and the silos. Um, workforce and training, very big issue, and that's one of the things we really have to push over the next few years. We have an inelastic supply uh, curve in terms of uh, workforce, and it is difficult to move that quickly. It takes a long time to train a doctor, a long time to train a nurse. Um, and long time trained healthcare workers. So we have to think well in advance of what we will need. Um, capacity and flow obviously come up as an issue. How do we flow patients through the system? Uh, what sort of, how many beds will we need? What do we need moving forward in the next 10 years? And of course, many people remind us that the system was inefficient in what it did, and we needed to improve the efficiency. Um, one of the other things that I really have to point out and uh, that I discovered on my journeys around many of our emergency systems and urgent care systems, there was a huge amount of excellent work being done, really good innovations um, and really good work being done. The only problem is we maybe weren't sharing it as much as we should share it. And that, of course, was one of the, the ideas from at least having a network to do that. Um, in terms of key recommendations, well, I, you really have the, 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 the 10 key points that come out as part of the No More Silos, which was developed off the back of COVID and this unscheduled care review. But it was around keeping emergency departments for emergencies and securing that, but also giving people better accessibility through urgent care centers, through telephone assessment services like other units have, through assessment units, we have surgical, medical, gynae assessment units, uh, a different set of units that people could go to and access their care from instead of just being an emergency department. Uh, older people featured strongly in terms of having an older person's unit. We do not want our uh, elderly population or elderly frail population to sit in an emergency department and come del become delirious and get infections. They need to go directly to the right place first time. Uh, mental health is not a huge issue that come up. Uh, and we need to deliver mental health in a much more core 24 or much more directed way towards the patient centering right 
uh, where they need the help instead of having to wait in an emergency department. Uh, child and adolescent delivering care to children in the community was a big recommendation to come up. And of course, scheduling unscheduled care. Uh, and of course, not every, uh, and this come up many times, not every case that comes as an emergency, you do not need treated and seen within one or two minutes. Many of them can be scheduled into appropriate uh, points of care. And indeed, it's much better for the patient. They go and have a coffee, come back and get what they need, or indeed be scheduled the next day or the day after for the correct appointment. Uh, direct admissions and improved triage system, rapid access clinics, um, and a focus again on uh, capacity. And one of the big things came out was uh, looking as well at the discharge and flow through the system. So these were all recommendations, and there's a detailed recommendations in the report itself. Um, I suppose really where we've got to at the minute is around implementing that change. And one of the recommendations was indeed setting up a network and the emergency and crisis of COVID, which forced us to say, look, you cannot have, I can't have 110 people sitting in my emergency department here because it will spread COVID like you wouldn't believe. Um, equally, we can't have people queuing outside in the rain or wherever else to get to care in an emergency department. So we needed to set up the network to start implementing some of these changes to deal with the, the problems that were presenting themselves as part of COVID. And um, again, the, as Chris said already, there's been a lot of uh, good work done around the, around, uh, the GPs and when they set up primary care hubs. And we really piggybacked onto this in terms of local implementation groups and setting up uh, uh, groups that could change things that were working together with primary, secondary and community care and then we have, of course, the 10 key actions, which came out of those recommendations I already mentioned. Um, initial results uh, are very promising from what has been set up so far. I'm sure you may well want to talk about those more. Um, but really, the focus, I suppose, of, of this, the network is getting on with a lot of the, the work of implementing these changes. And Margaret may want to say a little bit more around that. Um, but in terms of the uh, emergency care review itself, uh, as Alistair said, uh, publication then for further consultation a little belatedly because of COVID, but in uh, January, we, we should have that out with all the full uh, group of recommendations that fed into those 10 key actions. Um, and I'll maybe let Margaret discuss a bit now. Do you want to talk a bit around just where we are, Margaret, maybe? Might that be it? Um, yes, that's that's grand, John. Um, can come? We're hearing you there, Margaret. And even though, although we're not seeing you, and that's that's okay, I'm actually advised by broadcasting that some of the uh, connection problems are due to broadcast due to a uh, broadband on your end. So if if there are further difficulties with Alistair or Chris, uh, you may need to go on to voice only, audio only, as well. But we'll see how that goes. So go ahead, Margaret. We are hearing you there. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, and apologies. Uh, my video isn't working. Um, yes, just to follow on from what colleagues have said, um, I suppose from the primary care perspective in relation to uh, where we uh, started our journey, as Chris had alluded to, uh, that came about because of how we worked to quickly, quickly implement COVID centres. Um, and out of that and the learning that we had um, was a, a real cultural change across the service. Um, we had such... Um, a build in relationships across primary secondary care um, and when we were coming um, into the summer months we wanted to ensure that we had put in place appropriate um, sustainability and services as we came into the winter period um, and not uh, to lose the learning and also those relationships and cultural change that we had um, you know, to happen um, as a, a natural consequence of, of how the whole service turned to ensure that the uh, public were kept safe during the, the first surge. So um, the, the name, um, No More Silos, uh, really came and was, a you know, a, a part of that uh, journey. Um, and the 10 key actions then, as John and colleagues have alluded to, um, in respect of the urgency and emergency care review, they, they also blend it with um, the, our thoughts and outcome of the learning we had from the implementation of COVID centres and blend it uh, very nicely, neatly together and also uh, ensured uh, that our thinking in, in respect of what sort of services we could ensure were um, put in place to uh, accommodate COVID, but not just that for the longer term. 
So uh, I hope colleagues have had an opportunity to read through uh, the uh, 10 key actions um, and where we are to date in respect of those. Um, they're, they're very much um, intertwined um, and flow in relation to how they will work. Um, and it's not a case that number one is more a priority than number 10. Um, they are all been uh, enabled in parallel. So um, if I take the uh, introduction of urgent care centres, um, we have that up and running within Belfast. Um, and we, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll pass back to John just to, to touch on some of the outcomes that we have already achieved in relation to that. But certainly the feedback from patients um, and service users has been uh, very um, positive. Um, and we have information in respect of even complaints in respect of uh, weights and, um, you know, being assessed at the right time in the right place. Uh, that um, is, is proven very positive. Where we are then in respect of the phone first, um, we have had that uh, launched in uh, Antrim. And uh, it's, uh, sorry, in the Northern Trust area, and it first started in uh, Causeway. Um, and that has been quickly rolled out to Antrim and it started in regards to Foam First on the 1st of December. Um, and we also have rolled that out around the southern area, the whole of the southern area, and that commenced um, 30th of November. We um, have timeframes in place to commence in the West and that will be um, at the start of January. Um, and there is Foam First happening in the southeastern area as well. Um, and then timelines in place for Belfast uh, to commence that um, probably um, around February, March time uh, next year. Um, the other aspects of Key Action 9 then, an enhanced framework for clinical and medical input to care homes. Um, that's where we have uh, implemented a regional, um, what we allude to in respect of the GMS contract, a regional enhanced service, and that will facilitate GP practices given a more proactive input to care homes as opposed to what is within the contract, which is reactive. Um, uh, and that would be when uh, a resident feels ill um, and the nursing home contacts the practice, the GP practice would respond then. This is a more proactive basis where they will contact uh, the nursing home um, and uh, follow up individuals um, in a more timely fashion. Uh, before they actually uh, deteriorate. Um, and I think that will uh, give a lot of assurances into our uh, residents within care homes and residential homes. Um, so other aspects that we have uh, set up at a regional level uh, to ensure that we quickly implement um, and have timeframes against each of the actions. So we have um, a, a regional stakeholder engagement group and we have very active um, service users um, inputting to that um, and an extensive program in respect of PPI. And we've engaged extensively as well with uh, patient client council. We um, are also ensuring that any learning um, as we implement across these actions is shared across the whole of the service. Um, and we have had share the learning events uh, for primary, secondary care colleagues, anyone involved in the service. And they have very, very uh, heavily populated and, and have achieved a lot. Certainly the feedback has been extremely positive. So we've had one in 2nd of December, and that was around urgent care centres um, and Belfast Trust were presenting along with the GPs who've been inputting to that. And, and one yesterday then in regards to the launch of the phone first across the Northern Trust. Um, if I could also then say about phone first, I mean, it from a primary care perspective, it is being very much uh, led uh, by our out of hours service who are spreading into the in hours period. Um, so it is a clinical a clinical phone first. It is not similar to what is across the water, um, known as NHS 111. Uh, we are triaging here clinically um, and ensuring then that the standards that we're using out of ours um, are, are uh, spread across the region in respect of this phone first uh, in ours. Um, and some of the, the feedback and early outcomes we've had from the northern area um, have shown, uh, you know, 21% manage with advice, 12% uh, have advised to contact their GP, 
50% were sent to a scheduled slot. And that goes back to what John had said about ensuring that we see people in a very timely fashion, in the appropriate way, and in a safe environment and safe place. And we, we could not um, say that the if we hadn't have in, in acted some of these uh, actions, we wouldn't be in a position to ensure that our EDs weren't crowded. And that in itself puts our patients and our staff at risk. Um, we've had 12% of the uh, phone first triage straight to ED and then 5% on the ambulance request. So, I mean, for a very short period of time, I mean, the outcomes uh, are proven really, really useful and beneficial to patients. Um, I'll maybe pause there a minute um, and see if colleagues uh, have any queries or questions. Okay, thank you, and thank you all for those presentations. Um, if I could, as we go into question and answer session, if I could ask one member of the panel to lead on, on a response, and other members, if there's something strictly additional that you want to contribute to it, that's fine, but I suppose just so we're not seeing an overlap in terms of responses to get the best out of our time. Um, so thank you for that. I suppose, first of all, to say that I, I do believe that there had to be some kind of a transformation in relation to this. The, as, as outlined by Alistair there, the waiting times had become unsustainable and, and, and there, there had to be something done in relation to that. Um, and I suppose then, in, in terms of question, uh, there, there's a reference within the document to GMS enhanced services for cure homes. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious or looking to see what the role of GPs will be in that. Um, how will GPs help to support that, that particular requirement? Could I maybe take a lead on that, if that's okay? Yeah. Go ahead, Margaret. Yeah, thank you. Just as I referenced there, um, so the Enhanced Framework for Clinical and Medical Input to Care Homes, um, we, as part of the, the contract, the GMS contract is made up of core stroke essential services, additional services and enhanced services. Enhanced services are those aspects of, a, of the contract that are um, not compulsory for GPs to provide. As I mentioned within the GMS contract, uh, as it stands alone, um, the aspect of care is a reactive care. So if an individual becomes ill, uh, they contact the practice and the practice will meet the needs of the patient in regards to assessing them, diagnosis, treatment, um, all of that. What we have done with the enhanced service that we've developed is ensure that our practices are, are inputting to care homes and residential homes in a more proactive way. So uh, they will engage with the care homes um, and we're also uh, putting in place uh, increased support from trusts into the care homes. So it'll be a multidisciplinary team approach um, and that will ensure that the individuals um, aren't uh, sort of having to constantly engage in a reactive way, but there will be an ongoing input from the practices um, linking with the care home nursing staff, linking with trust staff who are being deployed as well to assist and wrap around that multidisciplinary team. Um, and, and that is what's all of our, our practices, um, Chair. Okay, thank you, Margaret. And in relation to the anticipated £12 million revenue budget, has that been secured? And if so, is it on a recurrent basis? Uh, I can pick that up if you want. Um, I'm not sure if Chris was going to be now frozen as well, but the, um, at the minute we're funding this through COVID funding because it is COVID response and we'll need to look at it in the longer term. Um, when we get to the end of this funding period, we're already putting plans in place for that. I mean, a lot of these models will need to be funded recurrently, um, but there is work still to be done. We're very early days yet, so non-recurrent funding initially, but we'll be moving to fund them recurrently whenever we are able to. Okay, thank you. And the, and the final one from me before I go to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron, um, and I think it was John maybe who, who referred to inelastic supply, and I think we're acutely conscious as a committee of, that, of those workforce pressures that, that continue to bedevil the system. Um, so in developing clinical care teams, clinical teams for care homes and the acute care at home model to avoid unnecessary hospital admissions, how do you plan to deal with the issue of getting clinical staff from a system that's already experiencing serious, serious 
staff shortages, and I suppose that problem of robbing Peter to pay Paul in a sense of taking staff from other under pressured areas. Thank you. Yeah, I mean that that is that is a massive um, and very difficult area. Obviously, and there are pressures everywhere at the minute, um, and we're asking a huge amount from staff already. We've been through two surge periods. Uh, we're likely to go into another one, um, and it's not getting any easier for people on the front line. So they, we've put out the obviously the workforce appeal. So we've got people coming forward for different areas who are able to are recently retired or qualified, and we have had a very good response to that. Um, but you're right, whenever we invest or put people into one area, there are pressures in other areas as well. So it is just about trying to balance it as well as we can because there are no, there, there is no secret supply of people, unfortunately, out there who haven't come forward already. So it's just about prioritising which areas we need to prioritise and making sure that we keep an eye on it throughout the, uh, throughout the search periods. Okay, thank you, Alistair. I will then, uh, so I'll go now to Pam. I'll then be going to Jonathan, and then I'll go to Paula and Colin on the phones. So, Pam, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel, for your presentation today. I suppose just to say initially that the, the No More Silos, um, the 10 recommendations, the key actions, are, are very welcome and, and very sensible. Certainly, obviously, my constituency is South Antrim, and I, I live in Antrim, so I'm well aware of the, the phone first um, initiative, and I think it, it makes great common sense. I think people like to, to know that they're not going to be sitting in a crowded waiting room for, for hours uh, on end. I think that's a very welcome move. Um, Dr. O'Brien did touch on, uh, I think, some findings around the initial pilot at Causeway, and obviously did move on very quickly to to introduce the phone first to Antrim area as well. I'm just wondering, are there, is there anything published in terms of, of, of um, the, that first pilot from, from Causeway? And I uh, wanted to ask around um, whether the rapid access assessment services have the, have the full support of all specialisms and are GPs well enough resourced to, to take on uh, their new functions in relation to urgent care centres in the rapid access um, assessment? Okay, th thanks, Pam. Um, maybe if I, I start with the phone first aspect of it. Um, we're, we're still collecting uh, the data, so we're, we're very happy to um, make uh, the Health Committee uh, have available information in respect of the outcomes. So that was just um, some of the outcomes we had initially. Um, and as part of the regional um, network, uh, we update um, and feedback and share the learning in regards to those outcomes as, say, the phone first aspect had a share, share the learning event yesterday. Um, so, yeah, we're very happy to share any of the updated outcomes as they become available. Um, maybe if I, I just touch on the um, GPs in respect of um, resource and the urgent care centres. Um, so that, that would be um, additional work. Um, and the urgent care centres are going to be run by the trust colleagues um, and the any input from the GPs in respect of the urgent care centres will be in respect of um, an advertised role um, and the GPs can apply as and when required um, to, uh, for, for those roles. Um, also, just to mention in regards to out-of-hours, so we're, we're looking to blend very much our out-of-hours are working hand-in-hand with hand the urgent care centres and the GP out-of-hours is, is resourced. Um, and we will be, as I say, trying to blend each of those services very neatly and closely together. Uh, John, did you want to say any more on the urgent care side of it? Yeah, no, I, I would just, uh, I mean, a few things probably pick up on the urgent care and the uh, specialty thing maybe in the, just the, the rapid um, the rapid assessment uh, in terms of the urgent care center i mean it is the certainly belfast it is primarily gp delivered and uh, delivered very well by gps at the moment but i mean i have done several shifts in it as well uh, as have a couple of other uh, colleagues from uh, emergency care too um ideally we would want uh, like in the the rest of the uk um acps and advanced nurse practitioners working in those roles as well as physiotherapists uh, and other uh, uh, allied health professions and, and specialisms because it is not the one of the key things about developing this system as we've already mentioned is the cultural change from the separation of primary secondary community care into what is the best care for a patient um, and if myself delivering alongside some of my GP colleagues which I did yesterday in the urgent care centre and some 
physios, like my on the half being for physio too, all in that same environment will deliver the best care for patients. So it's not simply about uh, what are GPs going to do or what are they going to do differently in urgent care centre. And indeed, the entire way we should work moving forward should be from a different mindset and a perspective of how can we deliver the best care for the users, for the patients, for the carers in this whole system, not what specialty should be doing uh, something where and when. Um, with regard to the specialties, it, it's quite a broad question about specialties, but obviously you have a lot of different specialisms in each hospital. Um, and so to say, is every specialty engaged in every hospital? Um, for, for example, I can't tell you exactly what is happening in the Northern Trust with uh, surgical specialties in, in, in one regard or another. Um, but certainly specialties uh, have become very engaged um, uh, in most aspects of this. They want to deliver care in a better way for their patients. Um, most of them that you speak to, certainly in, uh, in, my, in the Belfast Trust here when I work with them, um, they want to see the patient as soon as possible. They do not want their patients sitting in an emergency department for 12, 24 hours, or indeed, like me, I don't want my patient to not know about a sick patient that I have somewhere in the community that needs dealt with quickly. So anything that can get the patients to the right person quicker, the specialties by and large want. Um, we don't want to put patients away somewhere else and, and, and not have them coming through to us. So something that speeds up, say, coming into an emergency department and a scheduled appointment with, for example, in a rapid uh, access cardiology clinic or an ambulatory cardiology clinic or indeed a rapid access neurology clinic that we have here in Belfast or indeed the surgical assessment uh, area that we have in Belfast that gets the patient to go directly from the GP to that area and not via a whole set of other steps where they see multiple other doctors and ours down the line get to the right place is not what most specialties want. Um, I can't see any of them wanting that. So uh, they definitely uh, want that. Uh, in terms of, of rapid access, there are already quite a, a few rapid access um, assessment units there and they work very well. I've described a couple in Belfast already. Uh, of course, there, there's Gynae rapid access, ENT have rapid access, um, there's eye casualty. So a lot of this is about tying it together and making sure the flows are consistently through to those specialist services uh, and we can schedule people in in the right way instead of uh, putting them through uh, a rather an abhorrent and laborious and uh, poor and inefficient system to get to, the, to those specialisms. Uh, so to me, that, that's key as to what it's about uh, and we're pushing hard to get that done. I hope that covers the question reasonably enough here. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, I think it's a very exciting time just just hearing uh, some of this detail, and it's it's lovely to hear that you know things are really moving to a very uh, patient um, based viewpoint. So I think that's really welcome news. I suppose just a, a very small last point would be around communication, um, and and in terms of the phone first, for instance, has that has that worked well, and are people becoming uh, aware fairly quickly. I'm, I'm just thinking, I, d I don't know, apart from Twitter, I don't know what else uh, has been done in terms of communicating that very simple message of you need to ring this particular number and organise coming to um, a and &E. So if you could give us just a quick um, overview of, of how that's happening. Sure. <clears throat> I, can, I can pick this one up, guys. So we um, have set up a regional uh, communications group to, to look at communications and to, to think about mechanisms for pushing out messages and, um, and really to sort of get patients um, on board and, and to understand how to access the service. Um, partially, we, the idea of having sort of a phone first scheme is to um, reduce the sort of routes into the system and to simplify that process for people. Um, but you know, obviously that is quite a big change from the way things have worked in the past. And so we've been um, sort of pushing out in the usual sort of HSC ways um, of, of kind of leaflets and, and um, kind of posters and that kind of thing in, in HSC properties and on, on Twitter. Um, we've, so, so the early indications are that people are generally on board. So we've, you know, we've some sort of usage feedback that looks like, you know, people are making phone calls. And, and, and as Margaret said, there are some, um, some early indications that that's working okay. There has also been some feedback. Um, I saw an article on Solero Tool recently 
um, where there was some suggestion that there is still a bit of complexity and a bit of confusion out there. So I think we need to take that feedback and discuss um, how we'll make improvements to that. I mean, I think really it's, it's the fact that it's been moving so quickly because obviously, you know, part of this has been to try and get ahead of the, the winter pressures issue. So some of this has been necessarily done at speed without the usual kind of preparation and, and sort of thought process and planning that we would go through in, in launching this kind of service. But I think um, generally speaking, it seems to be going okay, but we are receptive to any feedback that suggests there are pockets we've missed or there are, there are people who are struggling to understand what we're trying to do with this. Um, we, did, we did put as much time as we could into that messaging. We sort of kicked that around quite a while even what we describe the purposes of the service, because obviously you want people who genuinely do have an emergency to understand that they should still ring 999. So then you get into that sort of tension of what is an emergency and what is urgent care and all of that. Um, so it's, it's kind of a work in progress and we will learn from each process, but we have tried to push the message out as quickly and as broadly as we can in the localities. And we have a sort of special um, subgroup set up to do that. And I'm sure we could share, you know, more details on the kind of activities uh, that group has been doing with the committee. That would be helpful. Yeah, that, that's great, Chris. And I suppose just um, a point would be that you could go down the line of using more social media platforms. You know, when it's so obviously it's not a regional uh, issue at the moment, but I think uh, there probably are um, social media platforms that may be more useful than Twitter, kind of more localised. And also use your political reps as well to, to spread that message and within constituency where appropriate. Um, I'd like to just offer that as a means of help. But thank you. Well, thanks for that. Yeah, really useful feedback. Thank you. Thank you. And, and just to reiterate what Pam said, I think there are some encouraging signs there, and I think it would be it is encouraging that that some of the impacts and lessons of COVID are feeding into that that no more silos and breaking down those silos and the potential for future and deeper and quicker maybe transformation that that brings. So that is that is useful. I'm going to Jonathan and I will then be going on the phone to Paula and then Colin. Thank you. Okay. Thanks to the panel for their presentation. It's, it's both a timely presentation for us given its, its crucial importance. I think it was mentioned that the system in our and the situation within our emergency departments was simply unfair. I think there's no doubt of that. It was being abused by, by some people and therefore leaving those that genuinely needed the service at a disadvantage. So I think that points well on the record and I welcome the action that has taken place to date. The full review, uh, I welcome that you mentioned that that's going to be published in January. Uh, but that must, and I have to stress this point, that it must follow uh, strong scrutiny uh, and indeed strong local consultation with the community as to the changes that are proposed. Uh, and, and that will, will bring us to looking at the progress in relation to the 10 action points. And crucially, whether the data is being captured to ensure changes being taken forward are not leading to lower volumes uh, in patients presenting for attention, rather than simply diverting them to appropriate services. So I really want to, to simplify my question uh, for service users. If I was a patient presenting with abdominal pain or indeed maybe a broken wrist, uh, what changes would I notice as a result of the steps rolled out through the action plan? Do you, do you want me to just answer this, guys? Because there is a, obviously a surgical uh, unit has sort of been started linked to the urgent care centre, yeah? Yeah. Uh, I mean... So um, ideally, either uh, if you are a, if you have uh, abdominal pain um, and you phone say phone first, the idea is that you be able to connect directly, uh, hopefully with one of the uh, units in the Belfast that would be directly to the surgery unit at the GP dealt with something sorry, John. seriously. Sorry, John. Jo John, let, uh, could I interrupt? Could you try coming off your video there and uh, try to go audio only? It's you're breaking up a bit. Apologies, is that any better? I think it is, yes. Yeah. Cool. I will, I'll try and slow down a bit, maybe as well. So uh, I was saying if you either phone first or indeed at the minute, the urgent care centre uh, in Belfast, um, if you came through the urgent care centre and you say you had abdominal pain or you had a headache or some other uh, type of problem you needed to dealt with, uh, you would be directed at the moment either through probably to the medical assessment unit, which is called the clinical assessment unit, or indeed the, sur the surgical uh, assessment unit for assessment. 
uh, thus bypassing the long waits and the delays of an emergency department. Um, if you had a, if you were judged at that early triage system, uh, to joint triage at the start, to have, say, an abdominal emergency, you would be moved directly to the emergency department to be dealt with in terms of emergency. Um, but if you had something that was not an emergency, you would go to these one or other units that could assess you, work you up over, say, a period of possibly 12 hours, may admit you or may be able to send you home and bring you back for the ne for a next day CT scan or indeed if it was a headache, a scan of your head uh, and get you appropriately to the right person first time in terms of maybe a, a rapid uh, access neurology clinic. Um, and because of that, you would bypass all the nonsense of seeing, say, three or four junior doctors uh, in through a long waited system and go directly where you need to be. Um, this is what users have asked for over and over again. Um, and those are the pathways we're working on, on at the moment uh, to get those in place. Now, they could be mental health pathways, uh, they could be neurology pathways, cardiology pathways, it could be palpitations you present with, uh, it could be any number of things. It could be cancer that you are presenting with or indeed a follow-up, but the idea is that you do not have to spend hours in an emergency department and we're able to connect you directly with the person you need to be connected with quickly, uh, both through access through uh, a phone-first system where you are triaged by a clinical professional um, and move to the right place, or indeed through an urgent care centre and move directly where you need to be. I, th I think that that's a very, very Lovely. important step-by-step -step breakdown of what actually would uh, the plan entail. And I think it's important when communicating to the general public that we really do break it down into that simplistic uh, manner that what it actually looks like for a patient presenting. Uh, and I welcome the fact, I think you said that early uh, indications show that there, it has added value to the system. So what proportion of patients treated at an urgent care centre uh, end up being admitted to hospital? Uh, very few is the answer. Uh, very few. Uh, just on, the, I mean, on the, the numbers there, the impact of the urgent care centre in Belfast over the past uh, month to six weeks, um, normally there's somewhere between 300 and uh, 350 patients that may come through the emergency department door. Um, the urgent care centre has dropped that down to about 200 patients. So between 100 and 150 patients less are going through the emergency department. Uh, and the emergency department can concentrate on uh, ambulance arrivals and the sickest patients. Uh, of the patients that will come through the, the front door sort of triage to then be divided up into the different spaces. And at this stage now, the triage based in the urgent care center. And um, the uh, uh, around, probably around 30% of people who walk in are directed uh, up, to, uh, up to the emergency department. Um, there will be around, I'm trying to think the figures exactly off the top of my head, say this, I saw when I was in yesterday morning, there was about 20 ISO patients. You're, you're talking another 20 to 20 to 30 percent potentially being seen and discharged from the emergency department overwhelmingly within, uh, within four hours. And indeed, it is worth noting that during the opening of the urgent care centre, the four-hour performance has improved by about 20 percent in the, in the hospital. Uh, because we're seeing these patients and getting them sorted much more quickly. Um, and then around, I think it's around, say, 30 to 40 a day will be moved up to uh, the assessment units for further assessment. And that is a, can be a longer process uh, where you may have to stay for a period of time, get CT scans, abdominal scans, determine exactly what's wrong with you. You may get, so for example, yesterday when I was working, I transfused someone, uh, an iron, I gave them an iron injection and transfused them some blood because they needed that. But they were old and they were older person and they, we were able to do that uh, within the day instead of, as we would normally do, have to admit them to hospital. Uh, so that's the key. And of course, it's worth noting that with our assessment unit, which did in fairness in Belfast open uh, now uh, a year and a half or so ago, um, it reduced the admission rate from 30% down to around 18%. Uh, so the, the, all these together as a combined group should absolutely reduce admissions. They should give patients what they want, be directed to the right place first time, and indeed prevent people having to sit in hospital for long periods and indeed be admitted for long periods uh, overnight um, and thus hopefully helping the whole system.
Thanks. That's is that helpful. Helpful. Thank you. A bit of around the numbers there, yeah. Yeah, no, th thank you. That's very helpful to see that that initial <laughs> sort of assessment shows such positive results. So I look forward to, to further scrutinising that when actually the full review is, is released. So thanks. Thank you. Yeah, oh. I was just going to mention, it, oh, sorry, I was going to mention it's in keeping with a lot of the evidence that has emerged in places such as the, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and indeed parts of the UK that run a similar system. Uh, they've published well on this, which is why we went towards this system as being the, the way to go, because it's quite well evidenced in that way. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> OK, I'm going to go then across on the phone to Paula Bradshaw. Paula, are you there? <clears throat> Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel, for uh, your presentation today. Um, I just want to start with a quote from a nurse um, who works in the emergency, one of the emergency departments, and she said, uh, it was a big, long um, email, but the final line was, the urgent care review and any other review fails to acknowledge that bed capacity is the biggest challenge facing emergency care. And I think, Alice, you touched upon it at the, at the end there. Um, but I suppose to prevent that um, the requirement for additional bed capacity, um, there will be a need then for those variety of specialisms that we know um, there's workforce pressures across the health service. And I'm just wondering if you can speak to the flow of people through through the system to make sure that these work so that the emergency department nurses are not facing the, the same problems over and over again. Thank you. Can I, um, Gordon, oh, sorry. And John, you, you can say more about it. You know, you'll have much more to add on it, but um, just on the issue of capacity, I suppose the initial actions we've taken are focused on what is deliverable. Um, additional capacity will take time. So um, there is often people often ask, should we have more capacity or should we have different ways of working? The answer is always a bit of both. You know, the, our, our hospitals are under really enormous pressure at the minute. If you look at the dashboard, which has pretty accurate bed capacity figures at the minute, they are some of them are run, running at over 100% um, fairly consistently. So there are absolutely enormous pressures on them at the minute. Um, but that being said, um, it's not hospital isn't always the right place for people. Um, I won't go into that too much more because John will cover that. So the main point is that uh, we accept definitely the issue around capacity, but it is not a quick fix. It is not something, as John said, it takes a long time to train up doctors and nurses. So to increase capacity takes an awful lot of time, and there are things we can do while we're while we're looking at that. Okay. Can, can I come in a, a little bit here? It's uh, <clears throat> because again. This is uh, an absolute, uh, you've hit on a passion of mine, and I really sympathize with that emergency department nurse um, because it, this drives me uh, mad as well. It's one of the, the things that I come into every day. I spent my weekend dealing with patients not flowing through the system uh, in, in a good way. Um, capacity, it, it, one of the biggest problems with this is that it's such a complex and difficult problem to get your head around the idea of how many beds you need in a hospital system, and it is so different in so many different ways. Um, I suppose to give you a background, because again, there is a chapter devoted to this in the unscheduled care review, you will be glad to hear, uh, with the, the nice piece of evidence set out around it. Um, Northern Ireland itself, it's somewhere in the mid-range of how many beds we do have. So we have 3.1 beds per thousand of the population. It's around 5,800 or so beds, down in fairness from 8,000 about 10 years ago. Now, most of those beds that were closed were mental health and learning disabilities and some care of the elderly. But we sit in the, in the mid-range at 3.1, uh, along with Italy, the Netherlands, Norway, 3.5, Israel, 3, Ireland, 3. The, the hospital systems that have much less beds per thousand of the population would be Sweden at 2.1. England is down at 2.4. So England functions on far fewer beds per thousand of the population than we do. Canada is 2.5, New Zealand 2.6, Denmark 2.6 or so. Uh, so they are, there, there are, we are mid-range. The, the systems that have really much larger numbers of beds, the largest number in the world would be Japan, at around 13 beds per thousand of the population. Germany's next to South Korea, I think it's somewhere in around the, the 11 or 12 mark. Germany being eight. Now, the big thing, that's bed capacity, but really what affects the system, if you look at the, the nice guidelines and all the evidence out there, is bed occupancy, which is different from, different from how many beds you actually have in the system. So, for example, if we wanted to go to, say, Australia, which is around four beds per thousand, we would have to build three hospitals the size of the Royal, roughly, to get to the hospital capacity of Australia at four beds per thousand of the population. Now, it is, in my opinion... And the problem is when I ask people well, how much more beds do you want, they don't, they can't tell me. 
because the system mathematically it works like a um, like a pressure cooker. So the minute that you have beds available, it's really interesting, Maz, your length of stay creeps up. So if you look at Germany, who, who eight beds per thousand of the population, their length of stay creep, creeps up to 8.5 days, whereas our average length of stay in Northern Ireland is around six days. Average length of stay in the UK is around 4.5 days now. If you go to Japan, where they have 13 beds per thousand population, their length of stay is up around the 16-day mark. So they keep people an awful lot longer in hospital beds. Now, the direction of travel of most uh, Western countries is against keeping people, keeping people in hospital because we know what they get clots, they get infections, elderly people can't walk anymore, their mobility really increases. So we are pushing, and most, people, most Western countries are pushing in good health systems, are pushing towards decreasing that time that is spent in hospital by older people, by people who are unwell and, and uh, need help. And again, all the, if you ask any of our users, any of our patients, they will say, look, if you can get me home, please get me home. Uh, I have cancer or I have heart disease or something. I want to be with my family. I want my care delivered in the community. I do not want to be brought in for long length of stay in hospital. So the question then really is, the two things that determine, two key things that determine uh, how many beds you need really is, what, how many people are you admitting to hospital? So I mentioned earlier about decreasing our admission in the Royal from 30% to 18%. If you manage to deliver care in a different way, in an ambulatory way, in patient's own home, as we're trying to do through acute care at home, you should be able to avoid admissions. If you manage to reduce the length of stay that a person is in hospital, and most of us know that a long length of stay is not good for a patient, then again, you decrease the number of beds you need. Uh, and really what we should be focusing on and what the NICE guidelines talk about is this occupancy rate below 90%. Now, at the minute, we certainly do not have an occupancy rate below 90%. And that's one of the key problems we have to deal with. The danger is we just go in with a very simplistic solution and say, you know what, we're going to build royal hospitals and we'll get ourselves to the, to the number of beds that Australia has per thousand of a population. Now, if any of you... Many, some of you may know, I've worked in Australia previously, they have ambulances queuing outside their EDs and they're just as busy as we are and they're completely inundated and they have the same problems as we do, even though they've got an awful lot more beds per thousand population. So the, the danger of just building beds and building more and more wards, one as Alistair points out, we don't have the people to staff it. So you just have empty beds sitting there that aren't staffed. But two, we could go exactly the same as other Western countries and we, our length of stay get longer, as seems to be the evidence so far. And so building our way out of a problem isn't an efficient way to probably do it. What we certainly know is we could certainly try and deliver a much better health system that reduces that length of stay down to the more efficient health systems, deliver care for patients back into the community, back somewhere else in the system, and therefore get occupancy rates below 90% not necessarily just build, build hospitals to try and get a way out of it. So there may be some element of we need to increase our bed stock, and in some areas we may need to do that, but actually there's no point in doing that while we still have a really inefficient system. So for example, an awful lot of... Our John, John, thank I, I just And that is, all, that is all hugely interesting, but I suppose we do want to continue the focus on, on the emergency and urg, urgent and emergency care. I'll just go back to Paula to check. Paula, are you... Uh, well, yeah. Answer. Yes, a bit of a, of a second, very quick question, and it was in relation to the community pharmacy pilot, the 24 7, and just to see if they could give us a wee bit more information about that. Yeah, community pharmacy, is that Chris or Alistair? Who wants to pick up on that one? Um, that, that's not something um, we're really involved in, but I'm sure we could get an update for the committee separately. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going then across again on the phone to Colin McGrath. Colin, can you give us your question, please? Yes, indeed, Chair. Thank you very much. I think we're seeing all the skills of a potential chief medical officer there, uh, and, and I'm getting all of our responses. Um, Chair, my question would be uh, about the um, just about the fact that we're now moving towards 
emergency departments, urgent care centres, minor injury units, nurse led minor injury units, GP out of our centres. And it's just that concern that maybe th- those that are involved in the, the tapestry of what our health service uh, interactions are, are we maybe confusing the public that will not know where it is that they're going to go to? Uh, are they supposed to phone first, not phone first, ring an ambulance, not ring an and, and is there not just a more simplistic model or, or is, that, is that just t- too simplistic to ask for a simplistic model? Okay. I, if I promise to be quick and short this time, uh, can, can I... I'm not telling John, tell John that we weren't all fascinated by the, by the... And I do know it does link to urgent emergency care, but I suppose... Um, and, and there certainly is lots more that we would like to talk about. But yes, please do be as succinct as, as possible. I will be succinct. I apologise. It's just because the, the, I know there are patients in my department and getting them moved through the flow, it really it does do, do, do something I want to fix. Um, in terms of, I, I'd agree with you, the urgent emergency care review definitely focused on the standardization. And one of the things we wanted to leapfrog was the fact if you went to England for the past 10 years, they had walk-in centers, urgent care centers, they had nurse led, they had all sorts of things that weren't consistent. Now, for England, they're getting their act together and they, they've set out a standardization. Um, as part of the No More Silos, uh, we wrote an urgent care policy that's a minimum standard that says exactly what an urgent care centre is. Um, so there is not going to be a whole plethora of different things available. An urgent care centre is clearly defined, and this is what it is and should do. Uh, similarly, emergency departments, similarly the GP, the phone first will also, uh, I mean, hopefully when it a bit further along, be standardised to that regional number. So there should be uh, an exact number of choices. You heard me earlier talk about standardization, clinical assessment units, medical assessment units. That all needs to be brought into here is the assessment unit service that that you will be put through to. And what the users wanted, they didn't want to say, well, I, they don't know what this, that is. They wanted one point of contact, like a, for a phone first, or one place they could walk into, like an urgent care center, and be lifted and taken to exactly the right place they needed to be. Didn't care about a name. And so that is actually the aim of what we want to do. Thank you. Okay. Briefly on that one as well, just to say, Colin, I absolutely take your point about standard, standardization, but there's two elements of simplification, I suppose. And in some ways, we had oversimplified the system in that ED had effectively become the only way people could access unscheduled care of any kind. And unscheduled isn't the same as urgent and certainly isn't the same as an emergency. So there, there is an element to which I think we need to increase the ways people can access unscheduled care. Um, but you're absolutely right. The message to the public, they have to be able to access it as easily as possible. Thank you. Alistair, Colin, is there anything else there in relation to that or anything yeah. additional? Yeah. Yeah, uh, because I just in my first question, I think Alistair maybe fell off his chair because I didn't ask about the down hospital. So I'll get it in in my second question. And I do note that we got a whole paragraph devoted to it. So I appreciate that. Um, and I suppose maybe the angle I want to take is how, how constrained are you in your review by history? And by that, I mean the development of the existing uh, services that are actually there because I mean if we look there was a, a parliamentary review about trying to reduce the number of constituencies which would have seen Belfast reduced by one from four down to three because there's a recognition that the populations are moving out of uh, Belfast but yet we seem to still have this over dependency with three accident emergency or emergency type facilities in um, Belfast and then others that are quite close and that's at the detriment of centres such as the Dine. So are, are you constrained by the physical layout of what's actually there at the current time and that you must place services there and you can't go to anywhere new? And then you do mention about the temporary arrangements around the development of an urgent care centre in the Dine. Can you confirm for me today, is it the intention that the emergency department that was temporarily stood down at the Down Hospital is now gone and that it will be replaced by an urgent care centre or is that a decision that is yet to be taken? Um, so Colin, if I answer the second bit first maybe and then I'm sure John will want to come in on the, the wider bit about the historical layout of services and the different services we can provide in different places. But the it certainly is not a long-term decision. This is very much still in the context of the pandemic. I mean, just um, as I'm sure you know as well, we already have 
more patients in hospital than we had at the height of the first surge with COVID. We have still mm-hmm. have more patients in ICU than we had at the height of the first surge. So Southeastern Trust are very much uh, in the in the phase of just managing the surge pressures they face. I mean, the ED is basically the challenge they have is they're trying to manage a COVID stream of patients, a non-COVID stream of patients, and an unconfirmed stream of patients, which effectively means they're running three streams within their ED, so it does put pressures on them. So there's definitely no decision made on that. It's definitely just something they're doing to manage the pandemic at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And John? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, yes, we are historically constrained by many things. Um, one of the problems in Northern Ireland is, as Alice already said, we've become we became completely reliant on EDs for everything, um, which in fairness, if you look to England, they didn't uh, over the past decade or so. Um, when we did look at some uh, some some uh, towns, uh, cities similar to, to Belfast, you do see that they have many fewer uh, emergency departments. So we have, you're right, three or four all co-located very close together that see patients. Some places in England did have one emergency department for the same sort of geographical area that would see fewer patients. But within that, they did have other systems like urgent care centres, a lot more direct admission of elderly people to elderly assessment units, and a lot of other avenues for patients to go to that got them to the right place first time. So we probably in Northern Ireland have become overly reliant on an emergency department, and it is a very, very successful brand, probably too successful in that way. As an operational manager here in Belfast as a chair division, um, if you said, could I close uh, any of the emergency departments uh, uh, at the moment, I couldn't because people are still reliant on going through that system. Um, What on earth would I do with, say, the 150 to 200 patients that needed to go through the Matter Hospital ED? I mean, this is outside of COVID, but I know everything's been configured in COVID, but you simply wouldn't be able to deal with the number as it stood then. So yes, you're historically constrained, um, but ideally you want to be delivering a system that allows patients to go where they need to be first time rather than being overly reliant on crowded and one might even argue, my colleague might even say, dangerous conditions in emergency departments. Okay. Thank you. Can I Thank add you. one final on that, would that be all right, Chair? Just uh, seeing, it, seeing as the day that's in it, seeing as the day that's in it, Colin, I think we'll give you one final quick one. <laughs> well, sorry, I was me rather than Colin, <laughs> but uh, it was Alistair. Oh, sorry, okay, okay. Who was that? Sorry, was just, that Chris? I did just want to say, and Alistair, it might be, okay. music, might okay. be music to Chris and Margaret's ears, but really what we saw in the other health systems that worked really well is big investment in primary care and community, not the hospital. <laughs> you know, so the, the care that can be provided closest to home is in those settings. And that is what keeps people out of hospitals and make sure they can go home from hospitals whenever they're ready to. So really, you know, as Bengoa and TYC have already said, that is where we need to put investment. Okay, thank you. So go on then to Orlea Flynn. Orlea, please. Um, thank you, and thanks very much for um, the briefing today. I found it really, really informative and interesting. Um, my question is around, um, so it, it was mentioned earlier that obviously it won't be a surprise to anyone that... Um, the issues around mental health and urgent, uh, urgent and emergency care um, was a huge issue um, within your review. Um, and I'm just wondering, I know that the Minister um, has said that he is hoping to um, also publish this month um, a review into crisis, mental health crisis services. I'm just wondering what interaction has this piece of work or has your group had with the review um, specifically into crisis services? Um, that's my first question, please. Do, do you want me to talk a bit about this, Alistair, or? Yeah, do you want to start, John, or, yeah? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I can say a bit just around, um, because at mental health, you're, you're absolutely right, it's, it was one of the, the work streams, um, and uh, again, came up with their report and review, um, led by uh, Maria O'Kane, a uh, psychiatrist and medical director in the, in the, the Southern Trust, but um, with uh, many of the mental health practitioners uh, involved in it, um, and of course, through the, the department as well, liaised with them as to, to the outcomes and the, the recommendations in the review. Um, which would be in keeping with the broad strategy um, for um, uh, for mental health. Uh, and we do, believe it or not, talk to each other a lot in the different aspects of this and how we deliver uh, deliver care. 
Um, I mean, I absolutely am at the, the sharp end of, of delivering mental health. And I would include in, in terms of mental health, I would also include addictions in that because my ward round yesterday, for example, the number of, of alcohol addictions, drug addictions, often mixed with mental health problems, um, as well as, as uh, mental health problems in themselves. Um, I had a, so at least, uh, let me see, good 14 people, maybe 12 to 14 people in, in my ward round yesterday. That this was the problem, and many of them were in that crisis environment. Um, and as it stands, then at the, the the review into unscheduled care, we did look a lot around the, the sort of the core twenty four model that makes sure that we have that wraparound care for people. And again, the big thing that concerns me is that people with mental health problems often sit in an emergency department for periods of time, maybe leave. They don't want to stay. They don't like being there they're in a very they're in a very difficult environment where there's a lot of noise and a lot of disruption and what they need is a quiet separate assessment area that allows the whole situation to calm down and us to do both medical and uh, mental health assessments on patients in a very joined up and coordinated way and that is absolutely the recommendation of or part of the recommendation of the unscheduled care review and, and would be in keeping it consistent with mental health strategies uh, that have been developed. Um, and maybe put my colleague, Margaret, did you want to come in there? Alistair might want to talk about mm -hmm. deep a little bit. I'm not sure, Chris. Yeah, maybe if I just, if you don't mind, um, Orla, just first, um, yes, we, we have been engaging in, and in fact, at our, our next regional meeting of uh, No More Silos Network is tomorrow morning. And we have uh, the senior policy lead in regards to the mental health uh, strategy coming along to speak with us. Um, we had initially um, thought, uh, obviously, mental health and access for patients would be one of our um, pathways in regards to rapid access assessment. Um, but we're considering how um, we can ensure that there's priority and focus given to, to mental health, uh, which follows on from what John had said around ensuring that the patients are seen in the correct environment um, at the right time and the right place and that, that the access is seamless for them. Um, and that's what our, our aim is there. So uh, that was just in, in respect to give assurance that we are engaging absolutely in regards to the network around mental health. Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks very much. And I'm glad, John, that you raised the issue around the addictions and even that core 24 model, because I know we still haven't got the consistency across the trust with rolling that model out. But I think that some of the recommendations within this review, even having that phone first service, because sometimes someone in mental health crisis, that's all they need is a bit of direction as to where to go, as opposed to um, going down to a, a, an emergency department. Um, so thank you for that. And then just very quickly, my second question was around, um, uh, also on Paula's point, I would like to see that um, more detail around the community pharmacy pilot that's it's um, hopefully going to be um, it's hopefully going to be prog progressed in the autumn. But my my um, other question was around it had mentioned around the the um, the telephone service that in the immediate future that health and social care trusts um, would be working with both the ambulance service and the GP providers to establish that effective referral and advice process, and then obviously longer term, you are aiming to have the regional single single number and single service. But so before we get to the point of the, the that single number and, and 24 hour service, um, who who is overseeing or who who would be overseeing that piece of work to make sure that you're having that communication now between the trusts, the ambulance service and the GP providers? Is that down will that be down to the, the chief executives of the individual trusts or will someone be overseeing that piece of work from the departmental level, because I know one of the overarching things in the review that you had already mentioned was obviously around that breakdown or lack of communication between primary and secondary care. So it's important in the meantime to, to try and get those um, lines of communication established. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 yeah uh, okay. So the, the the short answer is it'll be um, the normal silos network will oversee that. So we. Um, Margaret and John jointly chair a group that Alistair and I also sit on um, that monitors progress in all of the regions um, with all of the sort of 10, um, the 10 asks of the normal silos um, program. So we will keep an eye on um, how any individual piece is going, but specifically, obviously, our focus at the minute has been on film first and an urgent care centers because of obviously the, the winter pressures. So that is something we're very well plugged into. And actually, um, I suppose going back to my earlier point around 
how this has all been established because it's it's a network and because you you have sort of local leadership as well as centralized leadership the feedback loops there are extremely good so we get um very early sight of any problems or issues arising um, and often what we find ourselves in the center doing is facilitating local groups um delivering things as opposed to the more traditional sort of project management um project report sort of structure where you have to wait for certain junctures to act um so it's been working really well but it, ultimately yes the department um is monitoring this directly and, and is feeding back then to our regional management board uh, where the permanent secretary sits and that, that report sent into the minister so i mean this is being monitored then at the you know the highest levels in the system thank you thank you okay and finally jerry thanks chair thanks everybody for the the presentation uh just a quick comment and an equation um I think we need to be careful about the messaging. Kind of Colin alluded to some of it. Um, if we are seen or it's interpreted that we're telling people to stay from uh, stay away from EDs, I mean, obviously, with a situation where people have to stay away uh, from a range of healthcare settings due to COVID, and then after that, obviously, people were encouraged not to effectively neglect their health and to call their GP and, and do whatever was required. So I think we should need to be careful how we how this is uh, how this is pitched. Um, I think also it's worth, I don't want to preempt the report um, coming, but uh, it's worth saying that if there is any reduction of services, I think it would be a, a real slap on the face for everybody who clapped for the for the NHS, but I hope that's not uh, the case. Um, so just a sort of a question and a comment, finally. Um, I mean, my, my concern, or, or experience rather, uh, is people very often go to ADs or ANEs because there is long waiting lists and other healthcare uh, settings. I have, a, I have a nephew there recently who had um, major problems with ul ulcers. Uh, he and his mother were effectively forced to go to A&E because she was told she had to wait uh, two and a half years on, a, on him seeing a paediatric uh, gastric uh, clinic uh, healthcare worker. So the, her and I'm sure many other people are forced to go to uh, EDs and A&Es because other uh, healthcare settings are simply unavailable or people are forced to, to wait uh, too long. So uh, I just think that has to be taken in the, in the account. The waiter uh, lack of, uh, or sorry, the, the waiter um, uh, shortage of staff in, in our healthcare settings and, and how is that being factored into the, the whole situation? Because if you, if you tell people, you know, in, in, uh, in effect, don't come to EDs, but there's not enough uh, uh, staff in other areas, then uh, I would be fearful that people's health uh, is neglected uh, and gets worse when we obviously do not want to see that happen. Thank you. Thanks. Do you want me to start on that one, or John? Do you want to start, or? Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm easy. And as, as I understand it, it's sort of about the rest of the healthcare system uh, doing what they do. I don't know. Do you want to go ahead, Margaret, and I'll add anything you. Uh, sure. Sure. It was just. Th thanks very much, Jerry, um, for, for your comments. Certainly, the, the message is is absolutely not that we're asking people to stay away from ED. The message is to phone first. And by phoning first, um, we will ensure that the person is directed to the right place and will be scheduled in so they they are seen in a timely fashion. Uh, to pick up on, on the scenario um, in relation to the uh, young uh, person with uh, ulcers, that that is where our one of our ten key actions fits in around the rapid access assessment services, um, and that's why I said at the outset that the, these ten key actions are not listed in terms of priority. They they are all been dealt with and taken forward and implemented in parallel, um, and we would hope then by working with our uh, multitude of clinicians throughout secondary care, we will put in place pathways uh, to particularly ensure uh, that all aspects are. Um, put um, and the, the individuals are directed to the right place um, and they will be picked up in relation to those pathways. So we're engaging currently um, with the pediatric network um, and as uh, John had mentioned before with other clinicians, cardiology, neurology, general surgery um, and it is our aim then to put in place um, a multitude of these pathways so that individuals such as you have described um, when they phone first are directed and scheduled in so that they are seen, as I say, in a timely way. I mean, your comments around uh, there being a, a lack of availability of, of services, certainly from a GP perspective, yes, I mean, the, the long waiting lists um, are are absolutely the forefront of our minds because it's difficult for us to get our, our patients assessed. Um, 
And so we have full engagement from general practice and our secondary care colleagues to ensure that we do implement these rapid access assessment services, which we hope um, will improve access for all of our patients. Thank you. Yeah. If I if I maybe just then follow on very briefly, uh, just um, the, one of my main concerns is the people that don't phone 999, that don't come into hospital. So, for example, last week, uh, up to the emergency department, walked a couple of people who'd had heart attacks a couple of days beforehand. Um, my own aunt, who sat at home with her mouth dripping to one side without, uh, you know, really telling anybody because they, they, people don't phone 999. And the reason they gave is that we didn't want to disturb an emergency department. We didn't think it was really an emergency. Um, the key thing about offering something like a, a phone first service is that those people will have the opportunity. If they don't want to phone 999, they can phone that number and indeed Around I think so far, five percent of people who phone the, the phone first maybe have gone on to have an ambulance call. So if anything, this should have a higher pickup rate because the people that walk into me with their emergencies that they don't get something done about will have the opportunity to speak to a clinician quickly in an urgent care uh, in an urgent care through a phone call that can convert it immediately into what needs to be a nine 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 call. So I would hope to see a reduction in uh, patients that walk into me uh, with their uh, heart attacks that they've had two or three days before because they didn't want to disturb, they didn't want to phone 999 or indeed disturb an emergency department. So it should have the opposite effect with regards to that. Okay, thank you, Alan. Just a very quick question in, in terms of the, the phone-in service. Uh, what would be your sort of uh, uh, range of uh, target times for uh, actually answering a call coming in? If I maybe um, answer that, yeah. um, at the minute we're working to the standards for out of hours, so for urgence within 20 minutes and for routine within an hour. Okay. Okay. So, sorry, yeah. so what, what, if you could maybe explain that. If somebody's on the end of the phone, are they having to wait that length of time for the phone to be answered or do they leave a message and you return the call or what way does it work? They'll, they'll be answered first by call handlers. Um, and they're assessed at that stage, so they're trained against a set and set of standards. Uh, and so if they're deemed as urgent, they'll have the clinical uh, phone back within 20 minutes. And as I say, within routine, within an hour. But what about that original phone call, uh, you, you know, where the, the call handlers are taking the call? What is the, what's your target response time for the phone being answered from the patient dialing that number to speaking to someone? They'll, they'll be answered um, as there is available uh, individuals to answer. So that the the target time is when the the uh, call is answered, and then they're deemed urgent or routine. So a person ringing in could be could be hanging on for five or ten minutes for the phone to be answered in certain circumstances. The out of hours handlers uh, monitor uh, their lines in regards to length of time it takes for individuals uh, when they're phoning in. Um, potentially, at, at times, a very high demand, uh, such as we have sometimes at Christmas time um, on certain days and New Year's, uh, they may have to hang on the phone um, for slightly longer, but routinely um, they are answered uh, usually very promptly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, just just a quick one from me as well, and I'm hoping it, uh, it's a quick answer. Hopefully, is is available. But how many urgent care centres will be required in each trust area? Uh, certainly, from the the review uh, when we we looked at it, we had uh, suggested that each an ur there should be an urgent care centre um, and as per the college into a, in, uh, with each uh, emergency department. Um, the College of Emergency Medicine would of course support the GPs as well. They've written a similar letter saying that there should be something like that in in each space, but certainly each uh, large ED. Um, as per each trust, um, I suppose as it's rolled out, as consultation happens, we were talking about well, what does it look like and. Again, you have to do it around individual populations in each space of a trust as to where the urgent care centres are needed, where the community needs to be delivered, and an urgent in the community needs to be delivered, where there is um, an ED 
Uh, there's an urgent care centre, but it's when you get uh, where you need an urgent care centre without potentially being co-located to an ED, um, where it becomes a, a different question. A different question, I suppose. For each trust, we'd need to look individually at the trust rather than, than an overarching X number per trust, as it were. Do you know what I mean? It's not going to be a set number of you need three, four urgent care centres per trust. It will be based around that sort of population needs per um, geographical area and population need, really, um, as to what needs to be delivered. Okay, thank you. And, and I suppose that brings me back to just... Um, it's been a very interesting session. I think it's been... Sp- really interesting in light of the fact that we have heard from the ambulance trust in advance and it sort of highlights the complexity and the interchange and interreaction between all the elements of the service and i think it's it's really encouraging to see that there is you know that that reduction in silos and and that there are things there happening that are facilitating within the service facilitating things but i do think it is vital and i know there's been reference i would have i would have liked maybe to focus a bit more on it but time hasn't allowed to the consultation taking place in this, because I think that's the other crucial part of the jigsaw. Um, we recognise that COVID has disrupted the ability to communicate and, and co-produce and consult, but it's not, I suppose, and, and I know that you know this as well, a luxury add-on. It's a central and, a, and an essential component of the transformation that we need to engage in. So I really welcome the fact that that consultation has taken place, and I suppose we will come back to it again in due course to see how that, how that is going. But for now, I would like to thank you all for your attendance here today, for your presentations, your enthusiasm, your your answers, and all of that, Um, and to wish you and all of your staff well in the the very difficult and busy Christmas period that we're entering. So Dr. Margaret O'Brien, Dr. John Maxwell, Mr. Chris Matthews, and Mr. Alistair Campbell, thank you all, and good luck for now. Cora Melgov, Slam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, go ahead, Jonathan. No, just I, I find that fascinating to, to listen to. I know probably the one flaw for me actually, the technology element. I think it's it's hard to beat that face to face sort of interaction on these things. Uh, I find it particularly interesting actually hearing Dr. John Maxwell's. I think it was his response to uh, Paula's question, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of detail there from an international perspective as well. And I, I for one would I know that it's going to be published in January, but I, I for one would would like to hear. Probably from, from John, well, in particular, was an interest for me on that point. Uh, so at some stage, if it, if it was possible to have him before the committee, because I think, you know, given the conversation at the moment, at the moment in relation to bed space, in relation to uh, capacity issues and staffing, you know, he seems to have a lot of experience right across uh, the board, as opposed to not just Northern Ireland, but best practice elsewhere. I, I for one, would find value in that. I don't know what other members would say. Yep. Um, and we can take note, and, and I did, and I did actually allow that se- that that section to go on for quite some time because it was fascinating and was a great overview. I felt, you know, um, and I was I re- only reluctantly kind of drew it to a, drew it to a close. I have to say because I thought it was. So we could look at doing a a, se- a wider session. I think there would be some merit in it. Members are agreed. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, members, we're going to go in now to our to our, our consideration of some statutory a. Uh, statutory responses and and I, I think actually we should maybe look at a further session in relation to the urgent emergency care after that consultation period might be useful as well to pick up on that if members are content okay we're going to go into the statutory we're going to take a very short break just before we go into that so if we could come back for a 12:41 there so 12:50 please thank you Okay, thank you, members. We are now resuming with our with our business. Um, just before I do go into the next session, I'd just like to to reference the fact I have heard that we there is a change in the round of some positions, and as a result of that, we are losing Colin McGrath off of our committee. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank Colin very much for the work he has put in. Um, and uh, Colin, do you want to say anything there? Go ahead. Really typifies everything I wanted to, to interject and ask at this stage because unfortunately I have a series of appointments that are starting at one o'clock this afternoon. Um, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed my time on the Health Committee, but it's just it's impossible with chairing the Executive Office Committee as well. Uh, and originally I was only coming on for a few weeks to cover a colleague, but then with, when John Dallet passed away and we had to get a co-option in place and get settled in, I had to stay on just a little longer. Um, 
I know that Cara Hunter will do a, a great job uh, and is really looking forward to getting started next week and, and stuck in. Um, and I think that with the vaccine uh, program in place, um, certainly in terms of coronavirus, I think we're heading to better days from there. And, and I'm glad that I was able to sort of see out um, that whole process as well. But it's a fabulous committee, massive amounts of work. Everybody does huge amounts of work, not least the staff that service the, the committee as well. Uh, and I just want to wish everybody all the best going forward with the really important work of the health committee. Thank you, Colin. On behalf of the committee, I, I would like to thank you for your diligence and your contribution in what has been a very difficult time. And I think your, your, uh, your, your scrutiny and your attention to detail has been invaluable to the committee. We want to wish you all the very, very best in terms of, of your continuing, I'm sure, multiple roles. And we look forward to, to welcoming Chiara to the committee. So thank you. Thank you, members. Okay, so we we'll now move on to consideration of two statutory rules regarding coronavirus restrictions. I refer members to tab 7 and 8 of the pack, and in particular to the clerk's memo there at tab 7.1. Both of these SRs are subject to confirmatory resolution. Confirma sorry. Both of these are subject to confirmatory resolution. The examiner of statutory rules reported yesterday on these regulations. She raised no issues on SR 287 and identified a drafting error on SR 290, which the Department has undertaken to correct. Today is the last chance for the Committee to consider these SRs in order to come to a view in advance of the Assembly debate. Uh, and they are to be debated now. There is a revised order paper, and these regs will be debated on Monday. I can advise members that an official from the Department of Finance is here to brief the committee on the regulations and to take any questions we may have, and we will then, as usual, consider each SR in turn. So I'd now like to welcome via video link Mr David Hughes from the Department of Finance. And David, could you go ahead, please, and brief us on these particular statutory rules? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, as you say, uh, these are the uh, restrictions amendment number 17 and number 18 regulations. Um, and these regulations constitute restrictions that were announced on the 19th of November uh, and were in place for the two week period from 27th of November till today. Um, the number 17 regulations made on the 26th to come into effect on the 27th. Uh, the number 18 regulations uh, made the following day to come into effect immediately. So these restrictions were brought in um, after modelling had indicated that uh, doing so at that stage offered a greater likelihood of avoiding any further restrictions before Christmas. Sorry, sorry, David, um, and the sorry, executive David, had been advised David, that without. Sorry, David. Sorry for interrupting across you, David. It's a wee bit hard. Yes. To, it's a wee bit hard to follow. If you could speak a little slower, and it may be the case that I, I, it may be the case we might ask you to switch off your video. Actually, do try that, David, because your video feed is even unclear there. So broadband may be an issue. Um, if you could just slow it down a little, and okay. hopefully we can hear you there. Thank you. Apologies. Yeah, I'll, I'll also move slightly clo closer to the to the, to the mic. Um, so yes, uh, the executive um, took these decisions um, after having been advised that uh, without such an intervention, uh, hospitals risked being overwhelmed. And now, in the week preceding the decision on seventeenth of November. Um, the number of cases had stabilised with only a very slow decline, um, but the R number of the cases was around one. Um, hospital admissions had continued to decline slowly over the previous week, but remained at a relatively high level and had not decreased as quickly as had been hoped at the outset of the period of restriction. Um, hospital inpatient numbers had fallen even more slowly than admissions, uh, and uh, there was a major concern in terms of hospital capacity with hospital occupancy standing at 100%. So in those circumstances, uh, the executive agreed to put in place uh, what in effect were the most extensive uh, range of restrictions um, really since the spring. And these re regulations were designed to be a short, sharp circuit breaker to reset and drive down infection rates. They were accompanied critically by a message to stay at home, work from home if at all possible, uh, and otherwise only leave for essential purposes such as education, healthcare, the care of others, or outdoor exercise. 
Restriction number 18 regulations were made the following day to address two specific issues within the number 17 regulations which needed to be amended. I'll just talk through what the practical, uh, in, what in practical terms the regulations affected. Firstly, all non-essential retail was closed, um, although non-essential retail businesses were able to operate on a click and collect basis, and the regulations list essential retail businesses. Closed contact services and driving instruction were closed again, with the same exceptions as in the period the 16th of October to the 19th of October. So uh, that allowed for some exemptions for uh, film and television production, uh, services ancillary to medical health and social care services, and therapeutic services for elite athletes. Um, the number 18 regulations further provided an exemption for sports massage therapy, generally. Um, hospitality venues where food and drink are consumed on the premises were closed except those supporting essential travel, so those in motorway services, airports, harbour terminals. Takeaway and delivery services remained open. Self-contained tourist accommodation, such as self-catering accommodation, was closed alongside hotels and bed and breakfast. Indoor leisure and entertainment facilities, including soft play areas, gyms, swimming pools and so on, were closed. Outdoor activity and leisure facilities were closed, with the exception of parks and similar open spaces. Sporting events were only permitted for elite sports, individual and household out outdoor exercise, and school PE. Elite sports events were to take place behind closed doors without spectators. Places of worship were closed, except for weddings and funerals. A number of other limited exceptions were made to allow the buildings to be used to provide essential services for private worship and to allow the recording or live streaming of services by a small team. And the number 18 amendment regulations uh, extended the size of that team from uh, four to eight. So as you'll be aware from the statement by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister last week, um, these restrictions um, and others in place and schedule to, to the restriction number two regulations are to be lifted. And this is in part a reflection of the positive impact of this circuit break. So the latest R paper, which is actually dated 1st of December, um, the position is characterized uh, as follows. Um, it says that uh, over the last week, the number of cases has reduced. Um, there's been a decline in admissions and ICU occupancy. Um, R is below one for hospital admissions. And it says, this is likely to reflect behaviors, uh, sorry, um, stop that. Um, provided the current restrictions are affected, we would expect R for cases to fall again from next week. Um, hospital admissions have continued to decline over the last week, hospital inpatients have fallen more slowly than admissions and remain at a relatively high level um, in hospital deaths have declined somewhat from peak levels. Given the current restrictions, we anticipate that numbers will decline slightly or remain stable until shortly before Christmas. So the committee will be aware that the active period for these regulations is about to come to an end. They were only intended to be in place for a fortnight and this period ends tonight before midnight. Um, as Chairs mentioned, the examiner of statutory rules uh, reported on uh, these regulations yesterday um, and has drawn the attention uh, to the number 18 regulations in relation to an error in drafting. Um, the department actually rectified this drafting error by way of a correction slip on the 30th of November. I think it's just the case that that hadn't been registered with the um, source that the examiner was looking at. So that's that's the introduction to to those regulations. Okay, thank you, David. I'm going, go, I'm going to go across in the first instance then to our deputy chair, Pam Cameron. Pam, go ahead. Yep, thank you, chair, um, and thank you for that presentation. Obviously, um, we're still looking for a very balanced and proportionate approach to restrictions, which protects lives and uh, livelihoods, and takes account the the evidence on the rate of the COVID transmission in different settings. And I do believe that circuit breaker was very much necessary as the, our number had substantively shown an upward trend. Um, but as transmission rates seem to remain very stubborn in most council districts and the, fo the focus on monitoring 
um, I think is really, really important. So given that the, the transmission rates across the Northern Ireland local, uh, local council districts have remained stubborn during the period of the circuit breaker, what work is being done to monitor the effectiveness of each sectoral re um, restriction? And is it the case that wholesale closing down of society makes it more difficult to identify the specific drivers of transmission and means we cannot get the bottom of, of targeted measures that would actually be more beneficial? Yeah, go ahead, David. Yeah, so, so the question around the monitoring of the individual impacts of restriction, of individual restrictions, um, is that right? Sorry, I'm just making sure I've got the right note. Yes, I think I think it's um, there. Yeah. Um, I think on on this one, as as far as I'm aware, um, whilst there will be certainly there'll be indications of where risks arise when there aren't restrictions, it is probably that much harder to identify where. Uh, specific restrictions are having a positive effect, if, if that makes sense. So that if there aren't very many restrictions, um, it is possible to identify where clusters emerge um, and where uh, rates of transmission are um, uh, that much greater. And I don't mean just mean geographical, but say in particular settings. So that it is possible, I think I'm right in saying it is possible to do it that way around. But then placing restrictions on certain sectors or certain settings, it doesn't necessarily demonstrate the effectiveness of those restrictions because, as it were, they are restricted. I apologise for being a bit um, uh, opaque about that, but that's, that is my understanding of, of, of the way in which um, particular sectors may be targeted and where the risk is identified. Also, the, the evidence of uh, um, what the uh, risk factors are in terms of congregation of people, uh, in terms of the enclosed spaces and, and um, uh, 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 air within enclosed spaces being trapped, um, those are the factors. So where we know that there are, um, there are gap, large gatherings of people in close contact, um, and particularly in enclosed spaces, we know that the risk of that, therefore, is that much greater. Okay. Um, thank you, David. I'm sort of, I suppose you're a wee bit hard to make out, to be, uh, to be honest today. But um, I think it is a very hard to understand issue. Obviously, it's very difficult to get facts and figures around the impact of um, of restrictions when when everything is well, not everything, but an awful lot is effectively closed down. So it's very difficult to get that. And I think I suppose just going forward. If more restrictions are needed at, at a later time, um, I think you know what the what those certainly those businesses would want to see would be evidence around the impact that their business or service is having on transmission rates. So, I suppose that's by way of a comment for you to, to take back. I mean, I don't know how you yeah. I don't know how you get get around this issue, but it is a real issue, and I think it's a real bugbear for those who are, who are trying to make a living and keep a roof over their heads, you know, when when we can't actually give them the evidence that they so need to see in, in relation to the restrictions on, on their their businesses and their services. So okay. thank you. Okay, and Jerry. Thanks. Uh, David, I know it's part of my season coming up, but I don't think it's a bit absurd that uh, we're sitting here um, a few hours before the fact that reopening of society, um, shops and what whatnot occurs, um, we've got the Christmas arrangements coming through, and, and we're not really talking about the detail of that uh, today. Well, I, I do understand that the committee was um, seeking briefing on arrangements um, for the future, um, and uh, that's that's not something I'm in a position to do myself. Um, but you'll appreciate that um, the, the announcement has been made by the executive office about the, the broad shape um, of the restrictions um, that come into place tomorrow, um, and also the broad shape of 
what will be um, the situation over the, the few days around Christmas and understand that um, uh, uh, that request for, for a briefing has been passed to um, colleagues in the executive office. Okay, thanks for that. I mean, I hope we'll get it at the very least next week, but if we don't, then it's, it really shines a huge light on the, the processing uh, issues that we've raised as a committee continually throughout this, and it would be a real, real shame if we don't have a chance to scrutinise those you know, wide-ranging aspects of the regulations where there are there's some relief, obviously, for people, but there's also massive, massive questions. So um, I think that has to be uh, um, the executive officer or whomever has to relate to us on this. But I think uh, there's massive questions around process, which I think still uh, exist around this. Thanks. Thank you, Jerry. I'm going then across on the phone to Paula Bradshaw. Pa Paula, go ahead, please. <laughs> Um, thank you. The, the first question I have is in relation to um, the issue of removing sports or removing sports massage therapy so that it is permissible. And I had a constituent without giving too much detail that would identify her, but uh, her interaction with the police was that it wasn't taken off. And I had to then assure her and show her the legislative change. And so uh, my question really is around how you are engaging and um, advising those um, enforcement agencies around the changes so that they're, because everything's changed in such quick time, I'm just wondering, is there anything you could be doing to improve that so that people aren't put on, under um, distress as they open and close? Well, thank you. I do I do appreciate that. I think that there will always be some um, risk that, as you say, the speed with which um, changes is are made in particular the smaller changes. I do recognise that the, these small amendment regulations, which make one or two changes, um, those do tend to be made in quite short order in order to fix something that has been identified. Um, uh, and we need to be very careful, I, I understand, to make sure that um, the police and, and local authorities who have a, a, an enforcement role, that they are aware of them immediately. Um, where a new set of restrictions are being put into place. Um, and so, for instance, the, the regulations that will be made to apply from, from tomorrow, um, there's actually um, been during the past week from the executive's announcement to the point at which those regulations are made, there's extensive engagement, um, not only with the, so on the enforcement side, with, with, with police and councils, Obviously, also with the sectoral uh, sectoral representatives who need to know and to inform, particularly inform their members what's going to be expected, um, uh, and that's something which um, is uh, is uh, very important and is certainly improving. But I take your point that possibly where some of the smaller fix amendments are being made, we need to be equally rigorous in ensuring the message gets out. Um, thank you. I have, a second, I have a second one. I'm not sure, um, David, if you can actually answer this, but I do want to put it on record. I was contacted by a student, um, a PhD student who's based in Dublin at the minute, and she's concerned that advice has not been provided per se for Republic of Ireland students. And if you go on to the NI Direct um, articles around this, there is advice for students coming back from England, Scotland, Wales, separate pieces, and not to start a constitutional row. But I would have thought that it would have been prudent to actually also include um, advice for students returning from the South, given how many we know travel back and forth on that. So I'm not sure whether you can answer that, David, but I do think it's something that would be prudent in quick time to, to get up on the website, because obviously there's different restrictions around unnecessary travel, etc., cetera, um, in and around that area. Thank you. Mm. So, so you're right, it's not something that I'm in a position to make any response on particularly, because I think um, the, the guidance, the advice to students will be something that the Department of the Economy uh, would be in the lead on, um, but that can certainly be raised with them. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Paula. Jonathan? Thank you, Chair. And it's probably following on from Paula's original point on, on the enforcement side, and probably in particular to these regulations with new enforcement powers to councils. Um, yeah, I suppose probably what I'm trying to get my head around is the lag between the date when the restrictions are agreed and, say, for an instance, whenever the delegated authority to enforcement power 
goes to councils. I think in this case it was the 19th of November. It was agreed by the executive, uh, and then uh, the delegated authority power went to the council on the 30th of November. Could you maybe elaborate to me, um, in that intervening period, who is responsible for the enforcement element of that? Uh, when, from the executive agree, can the police then um, follow through with enforcement? Or, in sense, by the time it reaches to the council, the difference between council enforcement and police enforcement? Well, well the sequence normally would be um, that uh, uh, the executive reaches an agreement on the um, on the proposed restrictions, and there is a period of time during which the regulations are, are drafted and worked up. Um, it, it's only at the point at which the regulations are made, obviously, that they can be enforced. Yeah. Um, uh, the, I think, uh, forgive me if I, I get this wrong, but I understand that some change has been made about local councils enforcement, which isn't related to a specific set of regulations, but is rather a change to local council enforcement. So there may have been um, some uh, non-alignment of dates there, but it wasn't that the, the powers of councils were changed in respect of these particular restriction regulations, rather um, that it was being changed anyway, as it were. Um, so I don't think that don't think the sort of, if there's been any mismatch, it's not because it's a um, it's part of a single sequence. Uh, um, it's part of two separate changes: one to the restrictions and one to the enforcement powers. Okay, so I suppose probably I'm, I'm finding it hard to follow that exactly. Uh, it's probably harder because we we can't interact directly. But um, I, I think the twenty fourth. Uh, I remember comes to, to mind as the date in which it came into effect, but yet the authority, the delegated authority to district councils was agreed on the 30th. So there is a, a, a delay in timing, and I, I want to know from the date that um, regulation comes into effect, when the police begin their enforcement, if it's the police, or when the council begin their enforcement, because I think there's a period in between which I'm not, I'm not quite getting an understanding of what happens? Is that a limbo period? Uh, I'm, I'm not quite clear. I, I'm not aware that there is any gap between the regulations coming into force and they're, they're being enforced. As you, if you say, as, as you say, there may have been a change to the enforcement powers of councils which came into effect on the 30th, but it wasn't in respect of the regulations which came into force on the 26th okay. Okay. it was in general I think, yeah i think that sort of more elaborates my point no that's that's fine thank you okay and can you give us can you just give us a quick outline then david of where the uh where we stand once these expire so in terms of outdoor gatherings indoor gatherings and hospitality just a quick outline of of what now comes back into place Right. Um, the, uh, so from midnight tonight, um, non-essential uh, businesses, um, uh, including uh, non-essential retail, uh, but also those close contact services uh, uh, and driving instructions and so on, um, those will reopen. Um, most of the hospitality industry then will reopen, with the exception of those um, traditional non-food pubs. Um, hotels and guest houses reopen. Um, there will still be some, some restrictions on indoor sporting activity, um, so that things like gyms and pools will be open, but for individual training or, or with a trainer or with a carer, um, and non-aerobic activity uh, in groups up to 15. Um, other indoor sporting activity will be restricted. Um, outdoor sporting activity will largely be reopened, but there'll be um, a limit on numbers, uh, um, up to 15 meeting unless a risk assessment has been put in place, and an, uh, an absolute maximum of, of 500. Um, 
uh, places of worship will reopen, uh, that list of um, uh, leisure and entertainment venues, um, uh, also museums and libraries and so on, those will reopen. Um, so really the things that are left closed are the, the traditional non-food pubs, um, concert halls and theatres, conference centres um, and nightclubs. Um, the, the restrictions on, on household gathering will remain in place except for that short temporary period over Christmas. Um, so that's the, that's the, that's the main, main shape. Okay, thank you, David. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, we will continue now with our uh, consideration, but we can let you go. Thanks for that, David. Okay. Okay, members, we'll now consider each of those rules in turn. So, SR 2020 forward slash 287, I refer members there to papers at tab 7 of your pack. This SR gives effect to the decisions of the Executive on the 19th and the 24th of November in respect of a two week circuit breaker. The two-week circuit breaker covered the period between midnight on the 26th of November until midnight on 10th of December tonight. This ASR was made and came into operation on the 26th of November. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with it? No. So if not, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 287, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2, Amendment Number 17, Regulations 2020 and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you, members. Are members content to note the correspondence from the Minister at tab 7.2 of the pack, which contains a copy of the designation of local councils under the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2 regs? Yep, yeah, members content. Thank you. Moving on then to item 8, which is SR 2020 forward slash 290. I refer members to papers at tab 8 of your pack. This SR provides for increases in the number of persons who can attend a place of worship for the purpose of recording or live streaming an act of worship. And that limits that to no more than eight persons. It also removes sports massage therapy from the list of close contact services. This SR was made and came into operation on the 27th of November. Have I members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with that statutory rule? No, thank you. If not, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 290, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2, Amendment Number 18, Regulations NA 2020, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Agreed. Great. Thank you, members. Turning quickly to correspondence, members, I'm conscious of the time, but uh, I refer the members to correspondence at tab 9 of your pack and to the correspondence memo at tab 9.1. Can I draw members' attention to two items there? The, um, item 9.4 has been forwarded from the Committee for Communities. It's a response from the Department of Communities to this committee's request for information on the COVID support payment, if you recall. The response gives some details on the discretionary support grant available to those in a crisis situation, including those impacted by COVID. It also informs us that the Department is working with the Department of Health to promote the availability of the discretionary self-isolation grant as part of the Stop COVID Proximity app. We have tweeted out some information, which I would encourage members, if you can, to retweet that, just for information for the public. So, uh, comments from members, Jonathan? Yeah, no, just, uh, I suppose probably, I don't particularly know the context of why the, our, the correspondence that was obviously in a previous, like, previous committee meeting before me in relation to sending the correspondence. But I, I think we, we could be better served with maybe more information regarding the grant, more evidence uh, at what level of payments, for example, for expenses, etc. Because uh, a greater evidence base will then allow the committee to further assess whether further interventions are, are required or not, and how that's may in, being managed by the Department of Communities. Uh, any other views, members? I'm, I'm just conscious of this uh, of this overlap where we could actually be finish up scrutiny almost given the the widespread impact of COVID, almost in, uh, scrutinising every everything. But it, I think it, my view of that is that it would fall to the, the committee for communities to carry out that work. I think we have flagged it up as an important part of the health response, but I think we should mo maybe leave that to the committee given what we have in front of us. No, I, I 
no problem with that, Chair. Just I suppose probably that would be my thoughts on the, the correspondence that we received, yeah. that there needs to be a further breakdown, which would merit whether or not further intervention, as has been articulated by some members, uh, is needed or not. Um, so would members be content to get a more extensive briefing on, on all supports available? Is that what you're... I'm, no, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that. I'm, I'm saying that's my, my view on the correspondence that has been received. It may well be the case, probably is the case, that it's probably best served for the Committee of Communities yeah. to, to go into that further scrutiny. Yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. Okay. Okay, so then are members content to note then that item 9.4? Yep, members content, thank you. Item 9.8 is from the Committee for Education regarding the Department of Health's looked after children's strategy. Um, have members any issues they want to raise or notes on that? Um, or would members be content that we schedule a briefing from the Department on the looked after children's strategy at some point in the new year? Given that, yeah, yeah thank yeah. you. Um, so then, are members any comments or proposals on any of the other correspondence? And if not, are members content to note the actions proposed on the correspondence memo? Yep, members content, thank you. In table papers, there's one additional correspondence item in the table pack. It's, it's item 9.10, and it's from the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapy, thanking the committee for the role we played in securing direct AHP representation on the department's management board. Given we had a bit of a discussion about that earlier, are members content to note? Great. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Forward work programme then, item 10. I refer members to the programme at tab 10.1 of your pack. I can advise members that the Minister is unable to attend on Tuesday the 15th of December as we requested. However, if members are content, we could use that Tuesday the 15th to progress our consideration of the Cure Homes Inquiry report. Would members be agreed with that? Great. Yeah. And further, the Minister then has offered to meet with the Committee on Tuesday the 22nd of December. So that would be in recess, but the Committee, the, 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 the Minister has agreed to do a dedicated briefing there on 20, from 10.30 to 12. Would members be content to avail of that? Mm -hmm. Yep, well, thank you. Sorry, will that be in person? Is it in yes, well, that, that, that's, we'll, we'll, we'll look at how arranged based on restrictions or whatever at the time, based on time, but it is in response to raising the issues that we raised about lack of time and engagement with the Minister, yeah. so it's to try to make up some of that ground. Okay. So how we facilitate it hasn't been fully ag agreed yet, but we'll come back to members and on what, that. What date was that again? 22nd of December. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, are members otherwise then content, content with that, but also are members content to note the forward work programme? Yeah, thank you. Any other business members? Jerry? Chair, just the, the news on the, um, the strike pay being reimbursed for, for workers who lost uh, um, uh, salary wages earlier this year and last year for taking action. And I think it was a, a delay in, in paying it back, um, and a delay that shouldn't have been there, in my view. But I just want to welcome the fact that it has been resolved. And uh, I think it hopefully it sends a message to those healthcare workers that they are valued. Uh, so I just want to want to welcome that. But you know, disappointed that it took so long. Yep. Yep. Go ahead, Paula. <laughs> Um, thank you, and I would echo what Jerry has just said there, but I just wanted to also raise the issue around the um, private members' bill that's going through in the South around dying with dignity. I have received um, a response back from the Department of Health around that, so I will forward that, but I just want to further raise that at the all-party group on terminal illness yesterday, there, there are widespread concerns around that, around the, the hospices that operate here, so I do think it's an issue that we will need to keep a close eye on going forward. Yeah, thank you, Paula. Um, I too would like to reiterate and very much welcome the fact that that strike pay issue has been. I think that that strike was a very unique, a very unprecedented uh, development in the history of nursing, but also very important in light of the staffing issues and that that were flagged up by it. So I do welcome. I also welcome the uh, the, the decision now finally to get that that money paid. Okay, members, thank you. I'm moving on then to date and time and place of next meeting. So. Before we, we will be moving into closed session after lunch to continue our consideration of evidence on the Cure Homes Inquiry. I can advise that our next meeting will be on Tuesday, the 15th of December at 1 pm to progress our inquiry, and then on Thursday, the 17th of December at a, in the, here in the Senate Chamber. The time for that meeting is to be confirmed, members, as we have asked for an update on the vaccine rollout, as we had discussed in our last meeting. So that uh, could be an earlier start, so members just keep an eye on that, but we will come back to you and advise you in relation to that. Thank you, members, and good luck for now. The meeting is closed.
this is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chair.